Nicaragua was a phenomenal trip. Uh, we were all together the whole time. I think this is a trip we would absolutely re repeat, but um, this actually was a program that Dr. McKenzie was familiar with to some degree because she had a trip to, Gua to Guatemala. And I have spent, um, well, many years ago, I spent six weeks, weeks, six weeks studying there. So I was kind of anxious to, to try to try this project out. And this is through a school called um, La Unión. They have, I think everybody has a copy of it, at least um, electronically. They have a complete program that would be set out for us. Uh, there are some adjustments that we would make. Um, one of the things that we liked about our trip to um, Nicaragua was that we were in a very secure hotel together. So instead of us staying with families or at a hostel, we would definitely look for a hotel. Um, and the other piece that everybody seemed to enjoy was we spent two nights at the beach at the end and we may try to add that in. But otherwise we'd go along with their program which would um, have us doing some sort of uh, service project in the mornings and some touring in the afternoon, etc. So we're hoping we have your approval. So if um, they stay at the hotel, will that impact the cost per student cheap? That, uh, that I'm still not sure about. We're, we're, I have a whole bunch of them that I'm looking at. Yeah. So you saw the page with the cost per student. Yeah. Okay, so obviously we'd be subtracting the, um, the living expenses, et cetera, there, but then we'd be adding. So I'm not really 100% sure. Okay. Um, I, I'm thinking maybe it'll end up being a little bit more. Um, and this obviously is without flights, too. Right, and I know with the last trip you did a number of fundraising activities. Oh yes, and we plan to again. And yes. That's what I've been telling all, all my students are interested. I've been telling them that um, we definitely would continue with the fundraising. Right. I don't have any questions, but I think as um, knowing that this is a little ways off as it gets um, more pinned down with regards to the cost, sure. it would probably be good to just to have that come back to us as an FYI. Sure. Uh, I mean, Unless you guys have any questions about the trip itself. I don't have any questions about the trip itself. Okay. It's really exciting. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, I'm looking at the picture saying, I've been there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah we, we, were, we, we felt so this school is where I had. Oh, wow. That's yes. what it is. Connected us, thankfully. Right? Yes. yes. What are, the, what are the kind of service projects? I'm just curious. Well, they, they have a like couple, so a, a few different ones. So. When we were in Nicaragua, we did some um, building. We secured a, a learning center by building walls around it. And we also worked with the children. And I did make them very clear that we would be interested in doing both of those kind of activities again. So I think it's one of those things that whatever their need is, we kind of jump in. 
one thing we learned from Nicaragua was that when, when we went, they were wondering what kind of um, pro uh, not projects, but crafts we could do with them. And the, some of the kids had brought a few crafts, but um, now we know the job is bring crafts. So I think they will kind of plan that a little bit better. And I think that that will be the case with this group too. Like and then there's a couple kids. hours of Spanish education every day. Oh yeah, so that's another, that's a new one. We'll see, I'm hopefully, my the students that I've been telling are interested. Um, I hope that doesn't lure them away, but when I went years and years ago, it was a one-on-one, -on -one, and I believe that's the same situation. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's really exciting. Looks great. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. My son is ready to go. I've got him on my list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, what year is this, is this for? Um, I, next April, the year from this April. I uh, know, but with the grade set. Oh, we ask, we are including all high school students. Okay. So, if, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So. Motion to support uh, the proposed trip to Guatemala. I second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Um, so it's approved. It would great. It would be great to hear a little bit more over the coming. Definitely. Months. I just, just wanted to be able to get on with fundraising, etc. So yes. I will start that instantly. Thank great. You. Thank you. All right. Thank much. you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, next presentation. Student council. I have those, and I. I did realize something. There is a potential adjustment to the agenda. We will recognize Ben Anderson, the receiver of the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Certificate of Excellence Award when he arrives. With oh, okay. His parents. So it. when they arrive, we can stop what we're doing and recognize him. Okay. Uh, so our student council report. Sophie Berard has a report for you. And she indicates, this is Hopkins Academy, that student council's main focus for January and the month of February is planning for Spirit Week which will take place the week before February vacation. The students are looking for a way to incorporate celebrations of Black History Month in the day-to-day -day routine as well in February. Additionally, Student Council will be supporting the Gender Equity Task Force, which this has already happened in their launching of the Recognized Sexism campaign that happened at the basketball game last weekend on Saturday. And they will also be using their Student Council Instagram to help promote awareness for the group's goals. Those are the major events they're working on. They continue to have a desire in the future to work on <coughs> fundraising for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. They are looking to gather a team to walk in the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention walk at UMass in the spring. And they are also planning a career fair, um, I believe, in the spring as well. They have brought to my attention and Mr. Mish's attention some um, issues with bathroom sinks that apparently spray. Um, it's not our intention to hose children down, so we will be uh, looking into that and <laughs> taking care of it. And uh, we also, from our elementary school, you were made aware in their last update that they have a buddy bench committee, so they're creating a buddy bench, and uh, looking forward to bringing that idea to Hadley Elementary School. A buddy bench is a special bench where students can sit to show they need a friend to play with at recess, and the students are taught to invite a student on the bench to play with them. And they're also completing a grant application for the Martin Richards Bridge Builders. They're looking for funding for the bench, and they are coordinating a Bring a Buddy to School Day fundraiser, pay a dollar and bring a stuffed animal to school to offset the cost of the bench and installation. I would only encourage them to consider bringing a friend from another town and uh, for school choice purposes. <laughs> in which case, I will pay them to join themselves. No, not, I don't think I can do that, scratch that. Um, and that effort is in conjunction with Dr. Ryan as part of their, um, who's contributing to their social justice goals. And they are forming a second subcommittee to meet this month to create a survey of student preferences for their recess <coughs> equipment. And that's what's happening at Hadley Elementary. Is that right? That's yeah. I know. What <laughs> a committee work. Just they should run for school committee and select board and these other things. Is there an age requirement? No. For school committee. <laughs> I know there's two slots students. open, right? That are coming, or two people that are turning out to start. Not turning out, I think. Well, Not running again. Oh, running Hopefully, again. Running again. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Never turning out. It's like the Hotel California. <laughs> 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 That's right. So those are our student council. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Sure. All right, let's uh, hold on the next one um, and move then to Special Education Performance Data 2017 Indicators of Student Progress. Is that Pat? 
Yes, so there was a handout for you. Sorry, yeah. it wasn't included mm -hmm. early on. Um, but Amy asked if we could sort of separate out some indicators of how students with disabilities are faring in our school district. So because it takes many different measures to get a picture of kids with very diverse profiles, I chose to bring four different types of data to you to take a look at. Um, the first one and the second one are out of the Edwin Analytics for our MCAS data. You will see an absence of 10th grade data in some of these because they are such a small student body that they aren't statistically um, making their way into the reports that the state provides. Um, however, I am happy to reassure you that we have graduated most every child with a disability from high school in my term here of five years. And it's um, not to say we shouldn't do better to get kids up to proficient level all across the board. We hope for that for every child. Mm -hmm. But it's good to remember that a child who is in the needs improvement category still has the opportunity to graduate with a diploma if they meet the standards of the state which require them to take instruction in those areas of deficit throughout the rest of their high school careers. So even if they don't reach proficiency, they may end up with a, a diploma and be eligible for all the benefits that a diploma provides after high school. Um, when you look at the percentages of students reaching the expectations, I wanted to point out that there was also a new nomenclature for these different levels of performance. Um, 2019, I believe the high school will also have <coughs> different standards set for where the score should be and what they will call those scores. Um, but right now, the old um, standards were applying to the 10th grade. Um, from grades three to eight, you see the new categories, which are not meeting, partially meeting, meeting or exceeding the expectations of the standards at that grade level. So where we have um, partially meeting and not meeting, we're concerned. We would like to see better numbers there. Um, but we also know MCAS is one measure in time, and these are complicated students, and we want to give them every benefit of the doubt and look at other measures to see if we are doing all we can do to help move them along. The second um, standard there is the student growth percentile, and the second and third pages in your little handout to give you a graphic on the back sides of where the dark dot is where the students are landing with disabilities in terms of the state and the school's percentile growth factor. So where, if you look at the back of the ELA one, you see the grayish one at the top. There are all students of that grade level in our district. The X is the state's um, student growth um, percentile. And the dark dot is our students with special needs. So we are not that far off the mark in ELA for our student growth. Um, in mathematics, we are below where we'd like to be. We're a little more out of line with what the whole student body is performing and the state average. So we, we talk a lot about math and how can we increase um, different forms of instruction, how do we use our math coach most effectively, how do we look at curriculum differently? So those are ongoing conversations in the district because it's not unique to the elementary grade that math is our greatest area of challenge. Um, not just for students with disabilities, if you remember the other NCAS reports, it's, it's an area we need to look at improving our math instruction. Um, the third criteria that I pulled out was um, one that I asked the staff over the course of years to keep track of how many kids are meeting the stated objectives that are formed for them during their annual IEPs. So they were able to provide me with some information about students who are meeting or exceeding the targets set for them in their annual reviews um, and those that are showing 
significant progress after a 12 month period and a percentage of those goals that are showing very little progress. So I'll give you a moment to look at that and please chime in with any questions if you have any. This, this is from this year? This is from last year. From last year. And actually it's so, children have um, IEP dates all over the calendar. Mm -hmm. So they were asked to go to the last full IEP period because if they're in the middle of the IEP period now, obviously they would not have had a chance to actually meet or exceed a goal yet. Right. So we looked at the last four um, arts reports and we're going to one set of goals. So Pat, can I ask you on that analysis? You look at, you asked the staff to go back to the last complete IEP goal. Yes. That was a full, that was a completed uh, annual IEP. And then you just simply went to what was reported in terms of exceeded met significant progress actually as reported yes. at the annual meeting yes. and did that count and just count well the, the written progress reports so those are in the file folks read a lot of papers <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately it was a labor intensive effort because we lost sense tracker which was our data management system for special ed records um, we switched to school grades this year so we didn't have an electronic copy of everything we only had paper copies of previous year's um, goals and objectives. Um, some folks had kept their own copies, but some were just only in hard files. So we did a lot of digging and, and reviewing those progress reports from the last I, full IEP period. I have a question for you before we go on. Um, what's your interpretation just of the overall picture of this of met or exceeded or significant progress in this versus the little progress because these goals are, are, are done every year these objectives are <clears throat> done on a yearly basis in order to um, help that child attain that goal throughout the year so the the overall would be a hundred percent of the goals are met and that's not always capable but we're writing goals that are reasonable and achievable but still allowing the child to progress in advance so what is your take on just the variance i mean just looking from looking from k to three to seven to eight versus four to six like are these are these years where and, and i don't know the answer are these years where the curriculum is much more challenging for kids that year is it the group of children that year well, I think there are a lot of factors, and I don't think you can pin any one reason with more mm -hmm. weight than another yeah. individually. Sure. But we had conversations as a department, um, three of them, around this kind of information. And one of the things is, it's a little art to try to predict looking at a child and knowing him, maybe only for a year or maybe for five years already. Sure. How do I ac accurately predict what kind of progress we can make in a year for that child? Um, so that's one factor. I think the elementary grades, kids get more intensive interventions, which is sort of a district philosophy. We want to see a lot of early interventions so the kids are where they should be as soon as possible. So, and because of the nature of the classes, they're smaller, and kids can be in a group of two or three getting academic instruction in a resource room. So um, I think that's why those numbers are a little higher. When you get to the upper grades, um, the middle school is a very different model of delivery. And so that you do see a shift there, but also the nature of the goals changes. We're looking for more independence when they get to that grade span. And onward, we're hoping to push kids to be more capable of managing their own academic demands. So it's not a surprise to me on that reason that maybe some of the success is overshot in our goals for them. But it's um, something that I think, as a, di a district and as faculty, we can definitely improve upon. I know that it's a case-by-case -case decision of how you set a goal for a child, mm -hmm. and parents are a large part of that decision. So um, I think our most recent conversations were around what can we be doing differently? So I've sort of thrown a challenge out to the members of the faculty that find that one or two or three kids that you really feel like you need to find something different to do and bring it to the group and let's brainstorm, try something. Because doing the same thing all the time and expecting change, who said that, right? Is that Einstein? <laughs> Is not going to um, change anything. So 
even if it's not the right answer, we were, we're going to push ourselves to try different approaches with different kids so that we can expand our toolbox and hopefully improve some of these numbers all, all across the board here. Pat, uh, would it, I mean, I'm wondering, and I would invite you to, to challenge my thinking on this. One thing that jumps out for me is I think we find in, in regular education and special education when we're looking at what's well, early education, which is really pre-K through grade two, although we, we do band children together around K through three, but anytime we're looking at early education, we struggle to, the, the developmental variance is so great in young children. And we constantly have this struggle, particularly as even like uh, kindergarten becomes increasingly academic. So we try to write goals, and whether it's whether there are goals in an IEP or there are class-wide instructional goals or there are small group instructional goals, we do this with response to intervention at the elementary school for all students. We want to try to write goals that are as close to the grade level standard as possible because we want the student to be on grade level standard. The younger the child is, the more likely we are to see this kind of developmental variance in terms of their cognitive development. And those things level out quite a bit as children age. It also uh, makes sense to me that on the therapies, um, you see a speech language, occupational therapy, um, you see a slightly lower rate of met or exceeded. Again, that would be another place I think would be very difficult to predict, would be incredibly individualistic. And when you're talking occupational therapy or OT, you're often talking fine motor skills that can, so again, when you're talking young children, that makes sense to me that those two things are happening, right? But for younger children, we see, we do, we, we certainly would like to see, as Pat said, 100%, but it's also logical to me that when even, as I said, with response to intervention, when we're talking school class-wide instructional plans for all students, the younger the children, it's really hard to say 100% is going to perform on grade level or at benchmark. There's a lot more wild variance that seems to level out as they get older. I think it's good, though, to see, too, just to reflect on that, that the numbers of a little progress from 7 through 12 are much smaller. Mm -hmm. So even though you've got the small amount of children, you know, a small percentage meeting or exceeding goals, you've got a good amount that are making significant progress, which is yes. good, yeah. and very little children who are not making yeah. progress. Yeah. And the younger I am, right. everything is work, right? It, it, less is automatic. So the older I get, I acquire skills, and there are other skills that are now automatic. Right. When I'm five, I mean, holy guacamole, I've been conscious for three years. Everything is like, you want me to do what? Um, so everything is a challenge, and I think that's hard, and, too. And I think if you think further, those of you real familiar with the special ed world, will think of another half dozen things that might influence mm -hmm. these different kinds of numbers. The back side of that one page also includes a couple of the district-determined measures um, that folks use to gauge, and it's um, grade dependent. I don't have a lot from grade um, 12, uh, I mean 9 through 12, because that curriculum is really subject area dependent for that. The middle school does a lot of pre and post testing, but they're really more um, subjective in terms of skill-based models and Charlotte gave me a whole packet which I did not try to copy for you but lots of examples of how they do pre and post assessments for different skill levels in both math <coughs> and ELA and they include those that I've mentioned in that little narrative. Um, at the earlier grades we do math testing for all the kids in the, the school so I uh, wanted to talk a little bit more than um, normal about that because it's a different kind of scale. A rich score, score is just the, my analogy is rungs on the ladder through a curriculum. So a child and their fall assessment might have been on rung 20. And a number of kids in that class would have been anywhere from you know, three to 15 or 40 or wherever. So wherever you started the year, they start to gauge your progress. So you really just get a change over the course of a year. It's not linked to specific standards or norm to a group. It's based on that curriculum ladder. 
So, um, because again, we don't have a lot of kids, I didn't want to give any evidence that certain in individuals are um, represented, and I provided a range of scores and the means so that you can sort of see. I asked a couple of the gen ed teachers, what is a typical increase um, for their students? And I got anywhere from 15 to 20 points, sometimes as low as 10. But again, it's a wide range of growth for a typical kid. So if our mean is 13.3 in grade um, three, I think that's a healthy growth for those kids. Um, so the this is based on last year, correct? Yes. 2016-17. So that would have been 16-17 total growth, the comparison of fall to, to spring. spring. Yes. So the MAP testing is given three times a year, and the RIT score is part of uh, the measure of academic progress testing that happens three times a year at the elementary school. We just finished winter. Yes, we just finished in the last week. Mm -hmm. um, Ames Web is something done um, grades four through six, and it's again a point um, based of its own description, but the percent increase, a percent of students with um, those ranges of increase, I thought were helpful in looking at another way that we look at. I don't like the fact that we have 50% of the kids that didn't make any change in their standing in a year. I think that's something where we would challenge ourselves to find a new approach. What else can we try? Um, and the Dolch words are on um, the list that we use for the youngest kids, and they're just developing basic vocabulary skills. It is encouraging, though, when you look at the map testing to see it looks like there's only two occurrences across all three of the areas and then four of the grades. There's only two occurrences of the range showing a decrease from fall to spring. Yes. So, I, I mean, despite the no increase in percentile rate that you mentioned in the um, Ames Web, you're not seeing a decrease in, you know, and you wouldn't expect to see a decrease in progress, but sometimes it happens. But we do have two that you showed up that way. <laughs> you do. And you know, when I talked to the teacher about that, um, you know, they said, well, I know what they did because I watched them and they just, and they really did not take the test seriously. Right. However, we can't um, really objectify that kind of behavior, um, but there it is. and. Um, we don't really know what that child knows. Yeah. So. So anyway, I think that you know it's a um, an ongoing um, problem and challenge to get all our kids to the proficient level in the in review of what the state expects kids to be able to um, accomplish in their years of school. But I do um, appreciate that a child with a disability has a pretty good chance of getting a diploma in this state and our kids go on to all kinds of successful performance and we've had even the students that you never would have guessed made um, MCAS proficiency get to that point and are um, in college settings now and being successful. So you know the door is always open but we have to keep pushing it wider and wider. Um, I just want to go back to the graph in number three and I believe you already answered this question. Um, but the, uh, with, with, the different, uh, with the difference between meeting or exceeding and significant progress for 7 through 12, um, would you use that data to really think about the ways that you're reaching these students to make them gain more progress or use this data to write goals that are more achievable for the, for the students? Well, I think that's what I was trying to address. It's, it's sometimes an imperfect science to determine what growth you're going to see from a child in a year. It was good to see that, and uh, I went through many, many of these progress reports myself, that mid-year, there was a quick amendment to raise the bar for, for children, that you know, they had underestimated what the kid could achieve with the right kind of support. So um, I think you know, the goal is to get everyone to meet a realistic goal in a year's time. And um, that's uh, a tricky challenge, but it's not, not impossible and to see that we've got you know in some grade levels pretty decent showing of kids meeting or exceeding their um, their goals is is encouraging but I would like to see those numbers increase and significant progress maybe relinquish some of them <laughs> over there to that call. And Pat if there's one reasonable thing that we can help you do to change these scores what would it be? 
Well, I think um, in encouragement for trying new strategies to intervene with kids that are increasingly more complicated and diverse. I think our, um, I know Annie, you've asked for some help from the ASK to get some data on the character of our disabled population, and I presented back in 2016. The type of children that we are seeing now is much more complicated, and the, um, unfortunately, our numbers are staying stable, but your student body is shrinking. So our percentage is going up. And so the, it demands more resources um, from the district. And we try to keep our students in our school, but that means that our staff have to be ever more talented in addressing a wide variety of kids. So professional development, um, learning how to meet the needs of a more diverse student body is where we have to go. And I'd say that would be the best way for us to um, to increase our effectiveness. I would love to see, and I'll campaign for it now on television, <laughs> more professional development time built into the regular schedule. The school year needs, I think, more child-free hours for kids with students um, with disabilities. The staff that work with them are doing duties. They don't get um, to see kids during lunch or recess because they're on duties. They need more time to collaborate and to develop their own skills and coordination between staff members to make more effective progress for kids. That would be my short answer. Just a quick question about the numbers. You mentioned that they're their, um, you know, as the population goes down, the percent relatively is going up. So this shows 48 um, in the grades 3 through 8, but about how many in 9 through 12 are we talking about? So you're talking about right now 79? 79. 79. 79. 79. Can you that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And we've been in that range in the 70s ever since I've been here. It's yeah. been about the same. So, um, yeah. Of these students um, on the IEPs that we're seeing the, the, the uh, data from here, are all these students receiving some form of uh, instruction from uh, the special ed staff, or are some of them just receiving instruction from, um, from regular ed staff? All of these students would be getting instruction from either special education teachers or the related service providers. And I think one of the things I pointed out in um, 2016 was when I have a child with a math learning disability, he may get a total of three hours or five hours a week of specialized instruction. When I have a child who has um, severe autism or uh, complicated neurological issues or has severe social emotional um, overlay of a learning disability, he may have every service provider on the list seeing him during the week. So those, you know, the investment in time in the more disabled students um, is is quite apparently rising but is there a benefit would, would it benefit these students if like gen ed staff had professional development in, in special ed oh absolutely and i think it's key the collaboration i'm talking about is often <laughs> most effective when we have that whole team of general ed teacher and special ed staff and I know that there's, um, especially in the elementary school, because it's um, a very close environment, there is a lot of that that um, people would like to do more of. Um, we have a system of inviting people to the um, school earlier than start time when there's a certain student that they need to really do some head matching and trying to get some um, ideas <coughs> thrown out together to share time and devising a plan of attack for a child. So those are you know, case by case in nature, but during the school day, as I mentioned, special ed staff don't have release time to meet with each other. It has to occur right now outside of the school day. I have another question. Okay. So, and for Pat or for um, Pam, if currently where we stand, based on what you said back in the 2016 presentation, the complexity of students, and I, I, if it's the one that I was at, I believe I recall that presentation also being that a lot of children um, are now <coughs> being diagnosed which were previously not being diagnosed because some of these 
um, disabilities weren't even recognized in the DSM or the DSM has changed and the terminology has changed and more is known, there's more research known about these children. And so we know a lot more now for certain conditions than we did in the past. So where we are now, looking at this information, getting a general overall view, um, and I, I know it sounds as though as a district we're doing, we're doing pretty good, you know, maybe even compared to a lot of other districts. Do you feel um, that, in your opinion, or in your opinion, that there is a need for different resources or additional resources or a change in resources? Or are we fairly adequate with on par with what we need in the district? And I know Annie's done a lot of work on a, on a um, and always keeps us abroad on needs and is on top of that. I'm just curious in your thoughts. Well, if I look at caseloads, well, that's a complicated question. So if I, I look at caseloads, <laughs> do, I think, do I think our um, staff have reasonable caseloads? In general, yes. I mean, I was a special educator for a long time before I came to this point of my <coughs> career, and I know what it feels like. So do I think they have unmanageable caseloads? Not really. Do we have every aspect of um, our, our children covered in the amount of time that it would most benefit them? Maybe not. Um, you know, I attend the uh, Western Mass. There's a, a community roundtable for meeting the needs of children in early education. And the biggest um, concern there now, which I don't know how it will affect Hadley yet, but as you all hear on the news all the time, the opioid um, epidemic affects our student body in ways that we are going to see if we're like other communities in the area we're going to see a bubble of children with pretty complicated neurological needs we're going to have to use the resources from other community agencies to number one educate ourselves on how we best can meet those needs and number two how do we share resources because these are medically complicated kids. And um, I think that is our new bubble that we have to worry about. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can't, there's no one clear answer like, yes, we don't have enough. We know we have enough. I don't. There's never enough. There, right? <laughs> but I do think that we need to be aware of what's going on in our communities and try to be proactive. And I do think that educating our staff is an important part of that and how to and i know annie's made efforts we have um it's pd for trauma informed instruction you know there's been a resources dumped into social emotional supports we've um, invested money for consulting from behavior analysts so that we really try to keep on top of what we need to do and know to be the most effective and have we gotten feedback from staff on things that they feel like as far as resources or education goes or learning techniques that they feel that they need to be better equipped in their classroom? I, I don't have an answer ex except conjecture, so I wouldn't answer that yet. But it's a good one to ask, and I think the principals should be um, asked to help us get that kind of information. That's just something I'm trying to do as I'm getting to know the teachers mm. and kind of what they're doing with different students. So. Feel like I can't really comment on it now, but it's definitely something that I want to make sure that at all the grade levels, the special educators have the tools or the programs they need to work with the kids. So, excellent. And I would say for me, the challenge always is so needs change. It is it's really hard to to stay on top of the amount of technical knowledge that you have to have about a range of different learning styles, disabilities developmental trajectories, the range is so great, medical mm -hmm. needs, that it, it takes a tremendous amount of effort that I believe that our leadership and our staff demonstrate. It takes a tremendous amount of effort to, to try to stay abreast of that, to understand what evidence-based practice is for a student with a particular type of disability, and to understand how to implement that. And we want to do that, and then we also never want to forget that um, Knowledge of a disability is incredibly important, but the most important thing is to know and see the child, right? And so always remembering, too, that um, and if you've met someone with autism, 
you've met one person with autism. Like also keeping that, that's, that's a difficult challenge too. We want to be very technically skilled and well versed in these things and we never ever want to forget that there is, we're talking not only about addressing or, or remediating um, for how disabilities impact one's ability to access the general curriculum, but we never want to lose sight of every little individual, the, their own little aspirations and hopes, and, and as, um, as a parent said to me, so actually, yeah, so a parent said so beautifully not too long ago how important it is to remember that everybody wants to be seen everybody wants to be known and everybody wants to be recognized as someone who has something meaningful to to contribute so not in any way an aside but it's also part of always remembering we aren't just here to address deficits that the most important thing that we can remember is that everybody has something to contribute i do think that um you know we all know that Having an emotional component to learning is the most powerful <laughs> guarantee we have that learning actually occurs. And um, like Danny said of this parent, knowing each child is the most effective way we can make a difference in a child's life. And in general education, I think, you know, we haven't done a lot of it in this district, but I know a lot of the staff are aware of the principles of universal design for learning because that actually gives us such a wide open gate for any child if we all understood what that really meant um, the universal design and you know it sort of got locked into that parody of you know we're going to put a ramp up instead of the stairs you know everybody can use the ramp but in the how that looks in a practice in a classroom is something we're just sort of evolving into in the district i think and as they understand more and more that um that component of instruction and not having such rigid boundaries on how kids learn and express their learning will be really, really helpful for kids with disabilities, but all kids. And you know, any teacher that does practice and think about UDL also knows that that motivational component is the most challenging one to find for a child. Um, and that motivation comes, I think, when you go back to that that personal link that you can form with a child. I'm glad you brought up BDL because we have seen the Makerspace STEAM room mm -hmm. at Hadley Elementary School. So we have seen students for whom, no surprise, um, academic tasks are, are challenging and boring, perhaps soul deadening is the phrase that I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> they're just they're real, really not fun for the child and the child has difficulty being successful. And we've seen some of these children um, building and programming and coding and completely mesmerized. They're, they're just in their element, mm -hmm. right? I just think mm -hmm. of three right off the top of my head that people have talked to me about and said, just complete focus and it's been wonderful. So it's nice to have that place net. If only that could be captured on MCAS, it would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. for, for the district, not for the child, yeah. but for the district. And that goes back to building on the individual strengths mm -hmm. and not just trying to patch up a disability. Where is it hardest? Mm -hmm. um, but where are you the most successful? Let's just build on that, build a path from there. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's what we all want to do. But in practice, it's very challenging. Yeah. So I like seeing where our district is currently and going forward. I hope we continue to see progress and improvement. <coughs> and. Um, suggestions areas of need like Paul had said where we can help what we mm -hmm. can do feedback from parents feedback from staff who are teaching these children or with these kids day in day out I think it's I think it's really important you know there are other districts where there's professional development time built into their calendar on a much more regular basis and, and maybe that's something that the the board would be willing to examine as uh, an alternative going forward just to allow more time for that kind of activity collaborating and trying new things doing the research it takes to do a different child a different way and also remember we have that schedule of data presentation so i'm making notes of some of the things that you say you're interested in but um 
we'll certainly, so the question also to the school committee to consider is what kind of data do you want? And so it is, if it is next year, that feedback, when we say, okay, Pam, can you get feedback from teachers on the extent to which they feel like they have resources that they need? Um, it's certainly, it's designed to give you the information that you want and need <coughs> to make informed decisions about budget and policy, as well as give you a sense of the temperature of, of achievement and growth for student groups within the district. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. I, I really am sorry to do this around uh, adjusting the agenda again. <laughs> yeah, so there's nothing. But I want to be mindful of Julie's time. I'm Thank so you. sorry. Yeah. So Julie O'Leary is here as part of CPAC, and, and Julie, thank you. I thought you'd be interested in some of the information about special education. I hope it that was, does help, and it'll yeah. help me piggyback off of Good. Exactly so I know I want so you to be able to see that considerations for FY10 budget, and thank you. Thank you. Is that okay? So my name yes. is Julie O'Leary. I have a child at Harley Elementary with those complex medical and learning needs that Pat was talking about, and um, it's always a challenge, but um, first year being co-chair with the CPAC, we discussed a few things that we'd like to kind of propose, two things anyway, kind of piggyback on what Pat said. One was just some professional development, um, basically to look at, not special ed in particular, but to look at best practices for inclusion for all learners. And it really kind of made me think, and I was doing some reading and some research, and gosh, the studies that are out there that show um, those best practices put into play and the benefits of them are far outweighing the risks. And not to dive into the deep end is what Northampton did, just looking at some <laughs> very, just some best practices that some very small things that we can look into doing automatically. I'm not quite sure how much of the budget or what you may want to put in reserve for that if you consider that proposal. Um, I'm assuming we could find some free items, but just looking at the items online, there's small things that teachers can do from just items in the classroom to make the classroom more inclusive and have that more inclusive feeling to just basic teaching strategies and experiences. And it's all, I think, built around those inclusion experiences, not that you have inclusion all day, but inclusion experiences, mm -hmm. to make those experiences um, meaningful and having that child and that and my child is voicing his opinion and oh boy does he want to keep up with his regular class mm -hmm. so it makes me go back and think and, and do a little bit more reading and I came across a great statement that really hit home it said all learners or most we should never forget that all learners no matter mm -hmm. what the learner or diversity of the learner our general education students. Mm -hmm. So that's really important to remember. So finding those meaningful ways, those meaningful inclusion experiences, I think are important. That professional development, kind of piggybacking off of what Pat said, and boy, putting tools in the toolbox, um, having our teachers and staff be role models, setting that example, that's kind of what I'm would really love to see us kind of move towards. Mm -hmm. And I have an outspoken child who says, boy, mom, it would be really nice if I could, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's asking for that, and here I am. <laughs> <laughs> so in thinking about the proposal for time, uh, just because I know recently in, in one of the contracts that we had finalized, there was a, a very um, uh, discrete amount of time uh, noted in that contract as part of the unit really at the beginning of the year for a particular purpose and a question for you would be in addition to that obviously what what kind of um, estimate would you have in terms of a typical year what you'd be looking for like what would be helpful I mean because oh, that would just help professional us. development yeah for professional development and again I, what's I, already I apologize for not being super awesome prepared because I've been out of town and a little under the weather this week but I would look to these guys to help us with that mm -hmm. definitely mm -hmm. um, we heard from teachers and from these guys at our CPAC meeting um, but I would hope that you guys can help me out on what you think well, I think there are models too. you can look at in, in the Western Mass area. Every district does it a little differently. You know, some do it every week. There's an early release date. 
and others might have one day a month. I mean, there's a as many different school districts as options. So I think it's something you would want to look at some models and farm out some ideas to see what might work or be acceptable. Well, I think if there are models in terms of, you know, think about the, the structure of our district, the size of our district, and um, the proximity, obviously, of everybody being in, you know, two buildings, mm -hmm. I, because I think that that all contributes to what we might be looking at. But it would be helpful to just get a gauge of, you know, what, because there's obviously an extreme to, okay, this seems like a reasonable uh, request given the types of things we're talking about, the types of things that are already in place, and what we're really looking for beyond that. So, and, and I know that may not be for tonight, but it would be good to, because um, we, I think, appreciate hearing this, how we can mm -hmm. infuse this into budget considerations mm -hmm. um, without, you know, going over the top, but giving a reasonable estimate so that we can try to you know, see what we can infuse in there. And then I think we'd also, aside from working the schedule, have to then kind of get some input from staff about what are their, in, you know, what do they want to learn more about and what kind of PD can right, we, topics. whether we have staff that can provide the PD or someone we have to bring in right. so that, um, like we do need the collaboration time, no doubt about it, but we also need that specific professional development around whatever the topics are that we yeah. can decide that we want to highlight. Mm -hmm. Which can change from year to year. Right, the complexity and the length and the time mm -hmm. and yep. the type of course would vary. Mm -hmm. It almost would be something that, you know, and I don't know the right timing of it, but if, if you know, you coordinated looking in or anticipating a child from one year to the next year, teachers collaborating from year to year, mm -hmm. understanding, you know, kind of that communication from year to year, coming in or at the beginning of your teachers all talk and collaborate. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, this might be a question for Annie, like mm -hmm. how far in advance is PD um, planned? So, like so there's, it's planned um, several months in advance. There are five district-wide days. Some of them are at the beginning of the year. A lot of that time is utilized for mandatory trainings, also time for teachers to do setting up of rooms, reviewing things like individual education plans. Um, and then uh, the other days, like at the Hadley Elementary School, Responsive Classroom, Hopkins Academy, had NEASC this year. So they're planned several months in advance, if not even something like NEASC, a year out in advance for those big days. And there's a committee that is that uh, has members of most bargaining units are part of that committee and they work with me to determine what needs to be done. And in addition to that, this year, Jason Burns, the union president and I, put together a handbook for professional development that encouraged teachers to identify a topic or an area of inquiry that would be most meaningful for the students whom they currently are serving. So one of the challenges is there are certainly some kind of global best practices. How do we uh, create and support meaningful inclusion experiences? And very often, um, not all staff members need the exact same thing. So there can be a staff member saying, no, this, this particular class or this particular student, I have no idea how to help this student. So they have the option, they put together proposals, um, and districts, the district can award PDPs. If they put out a learning plan, what topic they're going to research, how they're going to research that topic, and a product of their learning if they present that at the end. So every single one of our staff members is a part of either a small group learning plan that might be learning about trauma-informed instruction, it might be um, researching more deeply into responsive classroom, it might be studying best instru if, in, in effective instructional practices relating to a particular disability. They study and work together or work independently some are working on uh, supporting English language learners, and then they produce a product <coughs> at the end of the year. So there's district-wide and there's independent and small group inquiry that happens. Um, the other question I was gonna ask is, in relation to the items, the tools that you mentioned for the classroom, um, and I don't know the status of this, but are there leftover funds from the Helping Hearts um, donation that where uh, <coughs> teachers could request tools and uh, you know, support 
And I know that they had earmarked some of those funds for uh, special education. So Helping Hearts works for the teachers. They don't go through the school. Okay. So it's a teacher request, Helping Hearts. When I say they before they approve something, they have us look at it to make sure right. that it's not redundant or something like that. But it really, the teachers request directly through Helping Hearts. There's, an, there's their request form and application for okay. Helping Hearts. So there may have been, um, I, I don't know, again. Uh, yeah, there have been significant requests from the special needs um, staff, and they've received a lot. That's so, great. Yeah. Okay. Okay, oh, something else, right? Oh, oh yeah. So yes. I have one other little proposal I wanted to put up there. You guys asked a little bit of question about resources and taking a look at the numbers and um, moving forward how we can improve that. And this <coughs> impact, um, when we met a couple weeks ago, we're also thinking the same thing. And I was on the hiring committee with for Pam and um, kind of informally using the survey that we did a couple years ago to kind of model and choose my candidate. <laughs> um, she's just been fabulous and um, we are thinking that moving forward how to best support her, how do we give her the resources she needs, is when Pat's going to be retiring at a certain point, how do we best support her moving forward. We do love that um, a lot of parents and a lot of staff are really encouraged around the coordinator role, um, having that communication, helping with that coordination, it is big, and not doing um, what we did a couple years ago with um, having a service provider to liaisons. Um, so there's a lot to like about the coordinator position, and as that um, changes moving forward, when Pat retires, how can we support it? What resources are we going to need? What do we need in reserve if this is going to be happening? And in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that feedback. I appreciate that. It's, uh, that's always, I mean, I, we'd rather hear that kind of input coming from uh, the folks that are most closely, you know, associated with it uh, in terms of then figuring out, you know, the, the staffing structure and the, mm -hmm. the structure for the future mm -hmm. budget. I think the decision to um, <coughs> create a coordinator role was great. Um, it's been a huge help and the, the feedback that I get from staff and the feedback I get from parents, it's been really helpful to have that one contact person. Um, and being in that that luxury um, box of, of being on the hiring committee for Pam, just really looking at her abilities and um, what she can bring to the table. When you were talking about resources, I just want to make sure we have what we need um, to support her in that role moving forward. Okay. Anything else, Julie? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Really helpful. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank I'm you. going to readjust the agenda. Thank you. The master Yes. So all you have to do right now around and wave at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have Ben Anderson? Because I'm going to talk about Ben right now. You just get to sit there and listen to all the things adults have said about him. Ben is the recipient of the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Award for Academic Excellence. There is one senior who is selected at Hopkins Academy every year, and Ben was recommended by staff, faculty and staff at Hopkins Academy and um, certainly I think the world of you. So I'm gonna read some comments that did not come from me and then I am going to embarrass you by reading a portion of my uh, college recommendation that I wrote about you. So written from other faculty. Benjamin Anderson, I don't know why I thought I just got young for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin Anderson is one of the most honest, loyal and compassionate students of the Hopkins Academy class of 2018. He is not afraid to step out of his comfort zone, voice his opinion constructively, or take risks to better himself. He is wise and mature beyond his 17 years. Benjamin is one of those students one can constantly connect with. Benjamin is ranked sixth in a class of 33 students. His weighted GPA is 4.01. Benjamin's curriculum highlights include AP US History, Advanced Placement, AP Language and Composition, AP Biology, 
AP Chemistry, there's a theme here, <laughs> AP Calculus, AP Literature, Advanced Physics, Honors Pre-Calculus, Spanish 3, Spanish 4. Benjamin has made high honor roll since freshman year. His commitment to his academics has earned him several underclassmen awards, including academic excellence in science, mathematics, and English. He has been a member of the Hopkins Academy Pro Merito Honor Society since September 2016. Benjamin's talents are evident in his various extracurricular and community service accomplishments. Benjamin is a valued member of the Hopkins Academy Boys Varsity Soccer Team. He is a quiet leader, strategizing the game and working intensely with his teammates. Benjamin is a talented and dedicated member of the Hopkins Academy Music Department. He continues to perform with the marching band, jazz band, and pep band, and has performed at the Big E, local parades, home basketball games, as well as other venues. As a peer mentor, Benjamin has an in, in a wonderful way of working with new students at Hopkins. Benjamin is an excellent listener and makes himself available to meet with his mentees who might be struggling with social or academic issues. As part of the Gender Equity and Diversity Clubs, Benjamin has been instrumental in setting the tone and goals of the club, which include helping students and faculty instill a sense of pride and confidence in diverse backgrounds. He helps educate others about the club. He helps to demystify de um, stereotypes and educate the school community. And he helps make a positive impact on our school's climate and our school culture. Our school is a better place because of students like Benjamin. That was written by other faculty members, um, contributions from other faculty members. And just a portion, I, I will not read the whole thing, although um, every word about Benjamin is spot on and truthful. But one thing that I, I pointed out in my college recommendation, the letter I wrote for Ben was, I'm always struck by students who exhibit far more courage than I have when I was here. Perhaps more courage than I have now. And what I'm most struck by is not only your willingness to go out on a limb for, for other people, but the attention that you pay to issues that one might argue, well, how does that immediately and directly affect you? Why do you need to care about that? So uh, just one paragraph. <coughs> Many students Ben's age might say that the causes Ben fights for, gender equity, economic and racial justice, equitable and compassionate global resource allocation, and equality and respect for marginalized people throughout the world do not directly affect Ben or them. One might argue these issues do not impact Ben's daily life. He's not female, he's not a minority, he does not live in a low-income country. But this is what distinguishes Ben from his peers. Ben does not wait for an issue to directly affect him before he acts. When conditions disadvantage any person or group, he believes it is a moral obligation to do something and to communicate a sense of moral urgency to others. So, I, I was not as smart or wise as you when I was your age, but quite impressive. And I'm happy to give this to you. Congratulations. Well done. And congratulations to both of you. Thank you very much. Speech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you the opportunity. Would you like to say anything? I'm okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well thank you guys. Well Where are you going to school? Uh, I'm not sure. You're not sure yet? Got some options? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and, uh, excellent. Where excellent. are you looking? I'm just curious. Um, I got into the four I applied to, uh, UNH, UMass Lowell, and Amherst, and WPI. So, um, yeah, I'm still weighing up the options. Do you have an idea of what you want to pursue? Uh, civil engineering. Yeah. We may be ready to do one of our locker rooms by the time we graduate. And I'm sure that Route 9, the bridge, will be broken again. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go back now to the fundraiser kickoff for the athletics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you need us to? No. Thank you very much for coming. This is like, yeah, this is this. This is what I'm ready for. This school committee looks desperate. Like, I know. I was so excited with all the cars in the parking lot. I was like, oh, I have a big car. Yeah. Not tonight. Okay. Thank you. All right.
Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, you so much, guys. So we had our kickoff fundraising mm -hmm. event last night uh, here at Hopkins. We had about 125 or so folks. The, the, was it the jazz band or the pep band? It was the pep band. Okay. Okay. It was great that they started off with a big Dale song that they normally play at the, the festival here. It just got us rocking. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, we had, uh, as folks know, we've, we've raised $400,000, uh, which is a gracious contribution from the town, from the CPA for our first phase. It's a multi-phase project, right? Estimated, mm -hmm. I don't know, somewhere over a million dollars. What we've, what we've done so far is we've done the soil testing out there in the fields. We have uh, awarded the contract to Berkshire Design Group to do the, the more refined specifications for phase one. So after that, we'll have the better, really detailed accounting of what the numbers are. But really what we're looking at is probably around <coughs> a little over, the current estimate is a little over 500. It was originally a little over 600, we trimmed it back. So that's what we're shooting for, to raise an additional $100,000, $150,000. Again, whatever we raise in this phase, we'll carry over to the second phase. Um, and so we wanted to kick that off last night and say, uh, we're gonna have a multi-pronged approach. We're gonna be targeting local businesses. Mm -hmm. We asked for input on what businesses folks think we should engage. Uh, we're also gonna have individual giving. Mm -hmm. We're setting up an online account. We'll do some social media. And uh, so any uh, person, any family, in the area will be able to donate. Any donation, no matter what amount, will be recognized. What we're planning uh, in the first phase is a temporary signage, probably by the shed out there on the fields, just to acknowledge anybody who is willing to contribute, no matter what amount. And then in phase two, probably something more permanent, a permanent sign in that area uh, denoting contributions. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned for ways to donate. Of course, uh, I should also acknowledge that Helping Hearts for Headley Schools is acting as our fiduciary agent, so as a nonprofit, they can take donations. Mm -hmm. So if you are interested in donating, you can, uh, uh, right now, probably the easiest way is to drop off a check, probably maybe. At the superintendent's office with, on the memo line, um, it would be made out to Helping Hearts for Hadley Schools, and on the memo line, indicate that it's for the fields. fields. They have a separate account that mm -hmm. they're keeping. I think, uh, as of within just in the last week, we've raised $2,800. That's right. Great. Yeah. And so in keeping with recognizing our donors, thank you very much to Irene Bukowski, one of our donors last night, and the Tudrin family. Irene is Mary Tudrin's mom. Uh, the Willett and Pfeiffer family, thank you very much. The Edward Hopkins Educational Foundation graciously made a donation. And the Umberger family, Brian and Alicia Umberger, thank you so much for your support of this project. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Exciting. Yeah, the goal is really to get us get it all going as much as we can this uh, later this spring, this summer. Mm -hmm. yeah. all right. If there are any questions or comments, you can reach out to me. You can reach out mm -hmm. to Annie. Absolutely. And of course, if there's anybody interested in assisting in any way yes. too, please reach out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, social media, accept the use policy. This is just meant as the first read and um, I will actually be grabbing you two after the meeting to say see if you're available on three dates we have as possibilities okay. for a policy yeah. subcommittee yeah. but this our discussion about social media yeah. remember I was odd man out no never and we all said yes we <laughs> remember so uh, so our attorney uh, from the Dupre law firm they looked over something that first advisors and students put together yeah. so um, describing what they're how they currently use social media the students with the help of the advisors put together a draft attorney Adam Dupre then reviewed the draft and made recommended changes what you're looking at incorporates <coughs> the attorneys changes uh, I will tell you that so with policy it's a first reading it'll be back in your policy in your packet next month just so we're clear, they were using Instagram already. You had said conceptually you're fine with that, and they're using it in accordance with this. They had already been using it. We just wanted a policy in place, so we'll have it back in the February packet. Great. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, next, CES Share. So, media and wow, you tell me that you guys like Instagram. Look at me. Look at me <laughs> trying to impress. Now, this is fantastic about the collaborative. Uh, we had a neighboring district that we shared BCBA with, Granby Public Schools, a, a board-certified behavior analyst. We share a position with them. Granby was thinking about uh, using a private company that assists with the management 
of uh, social media sharing. Mm -hmm. I'll describe it that way. That company, it was, it was a wonderful platform. The price tag that Granby had received was about $9,000 in one-time cost for their district, a per user cost. What I put in your packet, actually, the company I think is in the packet. It is listed in the packet, as long as some other companies are listed <coughs> in the packet. And um, you can see that there, there was quite a range of cost, including a significant range in uh, upfront costs associated with getting one of these platforms going. So CES, Collaborative for Educational Services, built one. And what we would need as a district would be the basic subscription plan. Because what we don't need is we don't need, School Brains already does the emailing and the phone, the emergency alerts, and I don't want to have to keep two databases up to date. Mm -hmm. And that School Brains notification system is linked directly to our student information management system or state data. So that one is pretty much almost always correct, unless we have somebody in there who doesn't want to be in there, but we're not missing people. So we would not need anything. I wouldn't move away from that system. Um, but what this would do is so someone like me could go on my phone and say, here's a message, right? And then I tap a button, and if we had a claimed Facebook page run by the school, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, that it would go out, that message would go out to all of those platforms. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I can. So all I have to do is look at my phone, pull something up, write a message, hit a button, and it goes out to school owned. And so if people follow on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram, they get that message right away. And that CES can do for $75 a month. Which frankly, I said to them, I'll just write the check right now. <laughs> I can't handle learning how to do all those things separately. So um, I, I thought it was wonderful. I thought it was wonderful that CES uh, developed this, they're going to, I offered to let our district be, they have to do something, what is that called, a beta pilot something, yeah. they have to pilot somebody. So I offered to to be the district that they pilot it with, and um, I know uh, maybe some of you and definitely, uh, Hugh Mara has, has encouraged me to use some of those tools to communicate with families and create a, uh, a presence like that, so I'm, I'm excited about what CES has to offer. That's it. I'm going to step into the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> Just now the 20th century. Facebook was like developed in 1970. <laughs> I don't know. We've so, been talking about how to promote our district, I mean, and mm -hmm. for school choice purposes. Yeah, and to me, I mean, beta or not, this sounds like a good at least starting point, but at a relatively inexpensive yeah. you know, amount that I think we had at one point and I, I don't remember, I don't want him to speak about this mm -hmm. coming budget, but we did at one point have a small amount carved out for like marketing mm -hmm. in, in terms of, you know, whether we wanted to do a brochure or something like that. To me, this falls under that because mm -hmm. you're trying to promote not only sharing of information for current residents, mm -hmm. but this, I assume, would be able to be found by somebody who might be looking at, well, absolutely. I want to go to Hopkins, what, you know, give me some more information about that, what are they up to? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm just curious. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. oh, I was, I was like, are there, in the, uh, is there already an existing Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn for Hopkins? No. Uh, there's for the, like, the student council. The student council. So, so that's where you're asking, like, for a district? Right. No. There is a, uh, no, we don't have a district Facebook page. They have friends of Hadley, but right. a district page, no Facebook, no Instagram, nothing on LinkedIn. And um, I did create, as I told many of you, a Twitter account. And then I got all confused and <laughs> tweeted something crazy. It wasn't inappropriate. It was just some weirdo rant. And thankfully, I only had four followers. Three of them <laughs> are related to me, and the other one was Judy Hull. So I, it didn't go far, but I'm going to get a lot. This is going to help me know how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would just like to just like to caution mm -hmm. um, social media is a great tool mm -hmm. if it's done thoughtfully and properly um, so there is the chance that utilizing a tool like this could not really could could have negative impact mm -hmm. almost on what other people were what other if, if people did want to search for Hadley schools mm -hmm. and see what we're doing on social <coughs> media if it it there is a chance that it could be done poorly, mm -hmm. um, to be totally honest. Right. So I 
personally would, and I, like, I'm all for beta testing things, I'm all for trying things out, I'm all for trying new things, pushing envelopes to, to as, as far as you're comfortable. Um, but I would be more inclined to um, even work with, uh, even work personally with the district um, on one platform at a time. Oh, to I'm, absolutely. To do it right. That'd be great. And so you don't have to, I think it says up to. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you can do as few or as many as you would like. And I, I would love that. I would really appreciate it. I do I do not want to have that little mini Twitter fiasco about that before. Is there a platform you would recommend like LinkedIn? It depends on who it depends on who we're trying to reach, to be honest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um if we're trying if I, I would start with Facebook. Yeah. Um, because that's where you're gonna be that's that you're gonna reach reach the majority of, the, of I think who we'd wanna reach mm -hmm. on Facebook. Um, I'd be curious to see what the back end of the CES share looks like. Uh, because I have a lot of experience with a lot of different publishing platforms, a lot of different platforms like this, and they're not all created equal. Um, some you can use the full functionality of the actual tool, some you can only use bits and pieces. Um, so I'd be curious to see what the back end of this looks like. Um, and I'd really want to try to figure out the best strategy going forward, um, utilizing any form of social media that we would do for yeah. outreach. But I would definitely start with Facebook because I think we're I think our target audience would mostly be would, would mostly be probably parents and and students as well. But the student you're going to get different messaging on on Instagram that you're going to get than you're going to get on Twitter than you're going to get on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and LinkedIn is more is more business. It's also mm -hmm. great for one to one um, relationship building. Um, so I think that there's some exciting things that can be done with that. But I would definitely encourage a one tool at a time. So I am right now, as you're speaking, emailing Bill Deal at the Collaborative and asking if I can put one of my school committee members in contact with uh, the gentleman who created the share. And then maybe you can, some of those questions about the, mm -hmm. what you're asking about the back end, and that would be great. And I would certainly welcome that help. No, and I'd be more than willing to, to, uh, to help out with that. But like, as okay. I've, I've evaluated like dozens of these tools, so I'm very familiar with just the different right. nuances of the back end of a lot of them. So. What was overwhelming me was the idea of trying to manage all these different spaces, that that was just even, you know, that was a lot to try to it up. And I'm also assuming that there's a way to, as I said, that realistically have it be a place, I'm thinking that it is a district giving information, it's not a conversation. Because I, I honestly, there's nobody at this point that would have the time to manage the content, right, of what's being posted mm -hmm. back. And that can, and that's, the, those are all settings that you can set up in at least Facebook to yeah. allow, to, to mm -hmm. allow or not allow comments and posts and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, so. Yeah, that's good, thank you. Budget agenda. Okay, now FY19 budget discussion. Chinese. Yes. So you heard from Julie. So we. I'm excited to announce that uh, Michael Morris, Dr. Michael Morris, the superintendent of Amherst Public Schools, has indicated that if we, and I will let folks know this, and in, in certainly in my weekly email, and I'm going to ask Dr. Morris of how he got the word out to students who weren't at Amherst that came back from Pioneer Valley Chinese Immersion Charter School. So Dr. Morris created, uh, I think he has a 0.6 position, so a part-time position of a Chinese teacher at the high school, middle school, high school. And on um, that position, it's, there is no introductory Chinese. It is specifically for if a student is thinking, I'd really like to return to uh, Amherst or uh, Hopkins Academy, but um, I don't want to lose my language skills. So what they found at Amherst was students who came back around middle school, if they left after sixth grade, they were roughly uh, high, uh, intermediate, low advanced, like what they're calling Chinese three, I think, at Amherst. If they came back somewhere in high school, they were in AP or beyond. And those are the courses that they're offering at Amherst. And what they have offered is that if we had students who could benefit from those courses, that they could Skype in. We're small enough 
our schedules do not match with Amherst, but we've had, we've made unique kind of concessions for individual students. A middle schooler who's taking high school math <coughs> courses. So we would work it out on a case by case basis with a student. They may say, I, I have, I'm going to take a class that period, I want to take it, and I understand it'd be an agreement with their teacher, meaning I want to take a class in Hopkins that period. Because our schedules don't match, my teacher's going to understand that occasionally I'm going to miss this Hopkins class because I'm going to be Skyping in, but it won't always fall at the same time. So sometimes I will miss a class to go to the Skype class, or they may say um, I'm going to have an independent study that's going to do the same thing, roam and rotate. But given the fact that it would be small numbers, we wanted to first just on a case-by-case -case basis, see what we needed to do to help students access those courses. But Dr. Morris, we will have to pay. We have worked out what the fee would be per student. What I do know is that it will not be the same as a charter tuition. That I know, it would be significantly less. So I'm very grateful to Amherst and to Dr. Morris for uh, working with us on that. I've also been in contact with an organization called the Chinese Language Institute. They are, they are willing to help us look at um, offering different kinds of tutoring opportunities for students as well. Is that a local place? Uh, no, it is not a local place. They do, they work with schools nationally. They do um, study, not only do they teach Chinese language, they do uh, study trips to China. They, actually, they do educational travel trips all over the world, places that EF doesn't usually, places like Morocco, Thailand, uh, China, several, I think a couple other countries in Asia. And then they offer, also offer language tutoring. They do it online. They can help you find teachers of Chinese if you wanted to find hire a full-time Chinese teacher. Um, so they assist with that too. So those are two things going on with Chinese language that we hope will, uh, if students are thinking about uh, attending Hopkins Academy, they, it's something they would like to do, but as I said, they're concerned about losing fluency in Chinese, we will um, have a means of supporting, uh, maintaining, helping them maintain their language skills. And is the Skype um, attendance like a one-to-one -one attendance, or because you mentioned there's a fee? They're like coming into the classroom in Amherst. They're coming into the classroom. So on our end, if you had like a room set up with the Skype connection, mm -hmm. could you have multiple students in the yes. same room yeah. Yeah. learning? Yeah. Okay. So it doesn't have to be a you and I are all both on separate computers mm -hmm. Skyping us. Okay. And how are you getting word out to some of the students in the checking the emergency So about? I'm going to ask Michael. Michael, excuse me, Dr. Morris actually saw a decrease for the first time last year in um, he had students returning and he saw a decrease in, in leaving. Um, and so I'm gonna ask him how he got that word out around the returning. I certainly know in the in the weekly email and I can ask people uh, in Friends of Hadley schools. That's not limited only to people who attend school here now. Um, so, I could do something on that too, also. Yeah, great. I could ask Facebook. the school itself to um, send <laughs> out. <laughs> We're trying to reach the students, then we want to just do Snapchat. Yeah, Snapchat. <laughs> All right. Uh, great. Well, that's encouraging. Okay, recommendations from town master plan. So I'll just uh, yeah. preface this by saying, uh, Kamara and I attended. I don't think any. I don't think we were all available. The um, all boards meeting hosted by the town, and um, during that meeting, really the focus was um, uh, for most of the meeting was to talk about the uh, master plan that was issued by the town. We all got a link to it. It is publicly available on the website. Uh, and in particular, it, you know, just really across all of the boards, just making sure that they understood what went into that plan and called attention out to the structure of the document and where um, each of the board's um, uh, priorities and goals were laid out. And so ours are included here for the schools. Um, beginning in the master plan, which is really that section 11, uh, where they've pulled out for each of the, um, for each of the goals that they've laid out, really, what are the different strategies involved in meeting those goals, who's the prime board on, that is associated with 
with those strategies, who else might be involved, so whether there's a secondary group or a, um, a collaborative group, and uh, the prioritization then within that goal, which of those strategies are the highest, mid, um, lowest, medium priorities, and then the year target. Uh, and so, Annie, I don't know if you want to speak to really the three um, that we had. Mm -hmm. right? <coughs> sure. Not finding the public so, 11-6, yeah. goal two, maintaining Hadley's commitment to school services. One, development of a school building master plan. And that really, I see that as the, the capital plan that the school committee reviews. Um, and so we certainly have that and we're con constantly reviewing that. Expanding adult education opportunities, there was mention throughout this document of the school department working with the Council on Aging. I had a meeting with the Executive Director of Goodwin Library and also with the Director of the Council on Aging yesterday or the day before. I had it this week. We talked about a number of things. One, coordinating our fundraising efforts for uh, the various projects that are underway for Council on Aging, the library and the schools to make sure that we're not interfering with each other's efforts. We're also actively working on uh, coming up with language and thinking about what it means to invest in Hadley so people aren't seeing disparate projects that are potentially in competition with one another, but this is a community that um, certainly where people are committed to investing their time and resources, and it's worthy of investment. And um, so we've already started talking about what that might sound like. We'll invite public safety into that conversation. And as far as adult education opportunities, we have had some conversations about uh, the Director of Council on Aging and I have been talking about ways in which we can connect our students with folks at Council on Aging. Um, we're looking at a grant right now that wouldn't bring necessarily a lot of money and resources in, but would support intergenerational activities and certainly we will work together to see how the schools can support any programming. I'm very eager to give students the opportunity to, we have a lot of students who are interested in community service either because of their academic groups that they're in, they have to do community service, and just because they're good, they're good people and they're good kids. I'm always struck by how much they want to give. And um, so I know they would be eager to share their, not teach AP Calc to a small group at the senior center perhaps. Yeah, have students who could do that. But, um, so we're talking about that. And continuously improve and support existing schools. Um, I mean, I, I think that's something that we do routinely. You know, what would be interesting on this one, too, is you think of adult education. And I mean, there's, you know, adult basic ed. You know, there's the basics. There's financial literacy, mm -hmm. which we've talked about here as being important for the students and mm -hmm. as a requirement and that that might be something that you know they could try to teach as well absolutely um, and then there's other areas so it's hard to know because it's just such a broad area but it would be good to get an understanding of what are the needs from um, the council on aging that they're hearing like if they're right. you know they're hearing that well i'd like to get, understand the computer i would like to understand mm -hmm. a little bit more about how i can use the computer to connect with you mm -hmm. know that's a very specific thing that I could tell you. There's a ton of kids that are in you know, either the computer science mm -hmm. courses or that could absolutely help with that because my own son is helping mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but that idea, and they enjoy it too, you know. Think about the robotics club that brought the robot um, absolutely. over to the senior center uh, to show off what it does and how they program it, and it was just, you know, so informative and enjoyable yeah. for them to also be around the kids, but mm -hmm. to learn about the amazing things that they were able to make this robot do. So it'd be very cool to connect some of the efforts, you know, between trying to build a community there and mm -hmm. uh, enrich our community mm -hmm. with the new facility and the planning around that, but also the kids here that want to give of their own. Absolutely. Space. Yeah, so that one excites me. That will be. Um, Easy, fun, and the sky's the limit. So yeah, I think the students are eager, and the seniors are eager to get to the schools. So yeah, that's. Good. And it's that's all that adult education means is just with the senior center. No, I don't think it only means that. That I, I really don't. I've just been talking to them. I think it could I think be the anything. library. I mean, if you think of the library and the senior center, both yeah. as being opportunities for um, a community of learners yep. that you get. I think you're going to get most Absolutely. of that population. And I know we have students who would be very interested in 
helping uh, adults with basic education, literacy, English acquisition. Um, we have a lot of students who are interested in doing that. The library may be a great place for that. The only other comment I have on this is um, the development of the school building master plan. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. We do have our capital plan, and we then we have projects that mm -hmm. we've mm -hmm. earmarked over the years, but. Um, when you read the master plan and you know you do hear some of the um, just discussions about investing in our town and investing in some new facilities, mm -hmm. there are questions that are asked about, well, we're investing in our facility here. At what point do we look bigger than just some of the, they're not small, but some of the items that are on the capital plan list. Mm -hmm. So that may be a topic for our retreat. That may yeah. be a topic of, um, you know, we're talking beyond a locker room, beyond mm -hmm. air conditioning. Um, those are fixes to something that I think the bigger question is, the building is aging, you know, mm -hmm. but we also know our population is getting smaller. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to have some serious discussions about that that, you know, mm -hmm. none of us will solve in our term, <laughs> but, but at least lay the groundwork so that we're not being short-sighted about mm -hmm. the bigger Question. You know, we want people to come here, but we also want it to be a facility that we're proud of and that's able to meet the students' learning needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else? So I, you know, I had asked that we add this on the agenda, and I could see we may come back to this, you know, later on in the year. But um, really, in just an effort to be transparent um, to the town but also as we talk with other with the select board and with other boards about our progress mm -hmm. in meeting you know these very specific um, goals and strategies that we've been that have been identified for us to meet so I'm encouraged by it but I also don't but I don't see this as a one shot agenda item mm -hmm. I think we should revisit it um, throughout the year mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a good place to start it is is at our retreat, like you said, looking years down the road where do we see the school, and obviously it may change term to term, but where do we see the school next year, five years, 10 years, 15 years, looking at that big overall picture. So even if you're not on the next term or you've whatever, you've at least got something that the next group can walk into, just like having school committee goals, have simple, more complex, whatever they are, something that that next <clears throat> person can walk into and say, okay, this is what the overall picture, this is what the, the mm -hmm. team, you know, the committee's looking to do overall yeah. mm -hmm. is a good idea. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Um, okay, circuit breaker funding and the look back. This sounds fun. Yeah, so just if <laughs> you are asking, if you, uh, all of you all can ask a good question. What are some things that may what affect the budget and um, positively or adversely? Circuit breaker funding, I, I sent you all some information about this. So there's some concern that circuit breaker would be funded at 65% rather than 75%. I sent out, thank you, Sue Giza in our office for helping. I sent out letters to all um, uh, our representatives uh, and a senator and I have heard back from all of them. So they are advocating for, for circuit breaker being funded as written. They're advocating to get circuit breaker restored. That is a priority for them. If it is not, the <coughs> estimate is that it would cost Hadley roughly $26,000, but that is just an estimate because circuit breaker, you don't know what until you have the actual expenses for that given fiscal year. So that's in wait and see. Um, it's a, it, it will have an effect, certainly not the effect that it would have on some districts, which are several hundred thousand dollars, but um, every bit of money counts. The LOOK Act is the language opportunity, and I forget what the OK stands for, um, but it's, it is an act that was recently passed that the way in which it could potentially affect the budget is that if your English language learner population is, I forget what the number is, or 5% of your population, and we are very close to it being 5% of our population, we're probably within about five of that, that that's the point at which parents have the legal right to come and recommend and request different educational programming options. 
the school district, my reading and understanding of the law is that the district is not obligated to offer what is being requested, but we certainly have to show due diligence that we're addressing, adequately addressing the needs of English language learners. The budget implications obviously would be that if parents, in the 5% of parents, they don't have to all be from the same <coughs> language background. So parents could come and say, we want bilingual education. And under the Look Act, they have the right to approach um, the budgeting authority for the schools and say, this is what we'd like you to consider. And that, so it could have budget implications in the future. Okay. And what's, what's the timing on this? Because I never know. Look at it yes. is in effect now. So it is. Um, so as soon as the district hits five percent, that option. Um, there are some other things that it's in effect, but they haven't written the regulations and okay. they don't have specific direction. Like often happens, they pass a law yeah. and the department comes out with the regulations. So those haven't been finalized yet. Okay. And I assume that comes with absolutely zero funding. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, anything else on that? No. All right, um, special <coughs> and stabilization. Mm -hmm. So this is something that David Nixon came and spoke with, with Chris and I about. Um, what you have in your packet is some potential draft language for a warrant article, and I've also attached for you, Fred Price's office, the attorney's office, provided you with the actual laws that govern the establishment of said funds. So what's important to know is that the law is really clear. Uh, chapter 40, Section 13E, and as well as the advisory from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, is that it does require a majority vote by both the school committee and the local legislative body. So a special education stabilization fund cannot be established solely by one of those bodies. Um, and um, we do, we do think of and refer to the school choice reserve as part of our special education stabilization funding for unanticipated expenses. It isn't solely for that purpose, and it is still legally a school choice reserve fund, like all ours. So it isn't, it isn't this that it couldn't be special education stabilization account on the town side without the majority vote of both. Uh, so there was some consideration David was pointing out, Mr. Nixon was pointing out that um, if we see school choice funding start to decline and there's the potential for unanticipated expenses, does it make sense to have a stabilization fund like this that the school department could draw on to address those unanticipated expenses? What, so, for example, uh, Granby recently had a vote. I think they had to uh, plug it just over 100,000. I saw Hatfield, I don't know what it was for, but they had to plug a budget gap, I think it was on the school side, $315,000. So, um, so it had to go to town meeting. They didn't have anything in reserve, so they, they went to town meeting for that. I, I believe that was Mr. Nixon's thinking in uh, the, the representation of this. Um, David's understanding is that there is a way to do this in which the school committee could access the funds without a town vote. I have to, to tell you, and I said this to David when he met with, with me and with Chris again, there, in the information I have from Fred, nothing in this indicates if it's a special education stabilization fund, it has to be voted. Any transfer out of that fund is is also voted. It's not just the it assessor by the school committee and a majority of the board is selected. Correct. So, so you can never just draw it down right, no, without yeah, a vote. Uh, right. That's so David was thinking the that there was a way that you could just draw it down. You can never draw it down without a vote of both entities. Right. So we so just voted though to try working or something. Correct. You need a majority no, vote no, here no. and a majority vote from that. So it's not finance subcommittee. Okay. Our majority vote, their majority vote. So just to summarize what we know so far, mm -hmm. in order to establish this, mm -hmm. we would have to have a majority vote. Yes. From um, both school committee and select board. board. Mm -hmm. And then to utilize said funds, mm -hmm. we would need, again, majority 
mm -hmm. yep. school board, a majority select board. Yeah. Is he proposing new money? We would add new money. He's not proposing to take them from our existing proposal, right? That wasn't um, that wasn't specified. And then it's two percent. So our annual budget is what seven hundred seven, seven million. million. So that's <coughs> And then we'd use it in just an emergency in case mm -hmm. we have unexpected SPEDEX expenses mm -hmm. outside of our normal budgeting process. Is there an advantage? Like, are they getting a better, um, I, I have no idea, New York interest on this money. Is it sitting, like, over in a fund, or is it just a, literally an account that's attached to it? Like, are we better off by doing this through the town because their rating is different than? No, well, they hold our money anyway. Okay, so, so we don't know that it makes no difference. Yeah, even our school choice, are bought, they're all town accounts. We're a town yeah. account. They're all town okay. accounts. So once the fund is established, the school committee may include a separate line item in their annual budget request for appropriate money into the stabilization fund. But so that, is, is, that is taking money out of our budget and putting it, in, yeah. putting it into the stabilization so fund. I mean, the only way this makes sense right, is if we increase it can't be a, a deduction from our existing annual budget because that's so tight. So what's the advantage of, of creating this versus keeping our what we have now, which is pretty much school choice? Well, typically we don't have uh, a, uh, a rainy day fund for anything in our budget. Right? And we run it pretty school close School choice. To we run it close to the bone, and then if something comes up, that we, school we, it's, that's we what school choice deserves. Mm -hmm. so we, and we have a policy around the school choice funds that we Correct. can't draw it down below. Uh, it's a uh, total amount of the previous year's grants plus something. I have right. To, exactly to, to basically give us a buffer if we get no grant money. So we can't dry, we can't drain out this whole choice fund. Yeah, no, I get it. So I like, I mean, if we're expanding the pie, this makes sense. If we're just cutting up the pie into different right. pieces, it doesn't make sense. So if this gives us the ability to go and say, hey, look, we've got this other account for extraneous expenses, um, I can see it. The downside is, um, and Annie, I think you made this point, that by calling out something as a special education fund as it goes up and down, I don't want to have um, any stigma attached to that. And that's the concern, right? It's like, you should have how much special right. education this year, and why right. is that? Well, who, you know, it's a, I think that's inappropriate. And if we yeah. can certainly steer the, the conversations away from that. Well, the other question would be to, so you've got this fund that now, in order for us to utilize those funds, you have to have a majority vote. And while we're all day in, day out on this committee, we know generally what's going on in the district and, you know, select board with a lot of different areas on their plate, what information do we have to present to them in order to get that majority vote? Is there an opportunity that that majority vote won't be met if it's something we all agree we want to utilize and we go to them and they disagree? What information do we have to divulge to get those funds? Like, how much information needs to be given in an area where these are, that you know, this is private information. Some of these funds that are being utilized is is personal private information too. How much, you know, it's just very unclear to me what needs to be said. If we go to school board or we go to tri board and say, well, we really need to use twenty thousand of these funds. What types of questions are we going to be asked? What right do we have to decline answering questions and how will that impact whether or not the funds right. will be appropriated to us mm -hmm. how much of a struggle would it be versus not i, I don't know well, and so i don't think that's going to be in the, the law here so i think maybe if right. we could set ground rules i mean i like the idea if we can expand the pie and, and if we can uh, because these costs are coming up and so then and i like the idea of having a fund that we don't have to Dip, dip in the school choice. So if we could set ground rules with the select board and say, because you know, we would both have to get in this together, here's how we're going to uh, divvy up the money. I mean, if there's money in the fund, then I agree with you, Tara. I want to be cautious about how we talk about this in public, but also um, it's not money that uh, is going to affect their ability to do something else, right? If we, Correct. Um, so the money would be intentionally for special education stabilization. So I, I will admit that it's, it's still, it is a bit confusing. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit confusing for me. <coughs> to your point, Paul, if, if, if it's about creating additional funds in the event of 
unforeseen circumstances, right? Um, great, there's an additional 2% kind of insurance. Based on some of the feedback that's been discussed in public meetings, I believe, select board meetings, um, based on um, the numbers that are coming up on the governor's cherry sheet that, that uh, Mr. Nixon just got today, my understanding is that there's an expectation that departments are being asked to look at how to reduce their budget. So I am confused by, I don't think there's any extra money because it doesn't make sense to me that departments would be asked to reduce their budgets. I think somebody just said, try board, this is the conversation, not that what are we going to do with our excess, but right. we have a gap, is what I've heard. We have a hold of it. Correct. <laughs> so so that, that would say to me, if this is just a redistribution of existing, then the budget is your authority, not mine. I, I would wonder why an additional layer of vote yeah. is then necessary. And I do worry so obviously my concern that it required town meeting vote was misplaced, that's not there. But um, we are so small that, and not that people would be, it, we are so small that, that you can, if you come with an expense that is, it's for this tuition, I mean it's pretty easy to thread the needle mm -hmm. and, and know exactly about whom you're speaking. Or it's just not that seems like a lot of work for, uh, not that any money is, you know, to be poo poo but we're talking $140,000 max. And can I ask, Chris, can I ask right? you, I should know this, it's net school spending. Yeah. It's not actual. Net school spending, yeah, so it's, it, it, it's not too it's, it's a, it was a little under $8 million last year. But is that, is that NSS or is that actual school spending? That's net school spending. That's net school. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, the benefit yeah. that there would be that the select board might see a little bit more of the our struggles. If they hear it from us, if they had to deal with it a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I mean, it might be educational. Yeah. We could do that, you know, is there a way, do they have ex executive session? <coughs> we're talking about individual things. I don't know, at what ground rules could we set to get to privacy? But all this is moot for me. If we're talking about just reducing our overall budget parsing a piece out that we don't have more bureaucracy on about how we spend it. That's that's not even selling point to me. But David's a smart man, so he must have some thinking yeah. in this. Right? I, yeah. 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 I totally agree with that about sir. This is just us taking our all the money that we already have and putting part of it somewhere else where we're gonna have to ask to spend it. Yeah. That doesn't make much sense. It's not a good marketing pitch. No. Yeah. No. And so that's clearly yeah. if it's about adding an additional layer of insurance for unanticipated expenses, that's completely logical. Right. And perhaps um, perhaps they can do that. Perhaps that is what they're talking about, and I'll find out. Because it could be that you can transfer funds from certain reserves into other reserves, but that you couldn't use them to fund operating costs that are ongoing. So right. maybe you could have both so you, that both scenarios of yes, we can actually set aside an additional reserve. And we need people to cut operating costs. Those are not yeah. incompatible mm -hmm. um, because of the laws that dictate reserves and how you can use reserves. Mm -hmm. As a side note, which is tied into kind of um, the tri board meeting that I went to, but it is relevant to bring mm -hmm. up in topic now. Um, um, one of the finance committee members had recently been to the HCG meeting and had actually. Um, questioned whether or not buying into something, um, uh, into special education stabilization into a fund such as the HCG fund, which would essentially be something that you provide a membership to and provide money into um, and get insurance, if you will. I, I, I don't know if you know more about how mm -hmm. all that works or not, um, and I told him that I'm not really aware how it works and that I would certainly bring it up to the committee. Um, but I'm still a little confused based on what I read, so I don't know. Yeah, it has some insurance yeah. like to protect against the tuition increase. So it's something that all no, it's specifically for special education funding. He yeah. said, and so I started just looking up their website a little bit more to try to understand it a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and basically, um, everybody in Hampshire County. Um, can choose to participate in this, and they provide funding and support for all different community projects. And one area that had been brought to his attention at the last meeting was um, a special case, special education stabilization. But 
and he said he would be willing to do a write-up of his understanding of it all in a letter to us as well. And I said, absolutely, that he could present to us. But I wanted to be sure to bring it up in case anybody wanted to do a little bit more looking into or if anybody knew any more about it than I did. It. Uh, was this the same yeah. that we that was the cause, oh, right? Sure. So this is the different. Hampshire County okay. governance, which Just is checking. different. <laughs> that was my, yes, yeah, yeah. So it's different, and I'm not. It's kind of unclear to me how how the group works in general, okay. but I do know that it's Hampshire County, um, and it's more like an insurance. So the funds, if, the, if you don't need the funds, you're buying into something that you may not end up utilizing. Mm -hmm. But if there's a year that you need to utilize it, then you're able to pull from those funds. Um, I don't think he had an amount or a percentage mm -hmm. that you could use. But either way, I figured I would bring it up, see if anybody else knew more about it, or, mm -hmm. and you know, I can ask that he provide me with more information. He's a committee member with the group. Yeah, do some research and ask about it, too. I hadn't heard of that. Okay, so is this one on hold? It sounds like you're going to get some more information. Yeah. I will. So uh, that quite just straightforward question of where is the, where is the funding coming? for the stabilization mm -hmm. fund. And if the response to that is that's money that is that would be transferred from an existing reserve account into just renaming, creating a new reserve account for this purpose. So I'll get the answer to that question from David. And then um, I, if the answer to that is yes, then I'll do some digging with Fred so you couldn't go into executive session to talk about transfer of money. The executive session, the 10 th things you guys read verbatim are mm -hmm. the same for all. It's the same for municipal governments. It's the reasons yeah. for executive session are the same for all municipal governments. The only reason you can shut the doors down. Um, you, you evaluate me in public. You can't do that privately. There are very few oh, we reasons. Oh, privately, too. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I'll get you down on Facebook when I get the little button. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> and, uh, and so it's, if we weren't, yeah, it'd be, it'd be, we just, I'll ask more questions about that okay. too. Like how, how would you manage something like that? Ground yeah. rules, even in public session where it can get yeah. stopped. Yeah. Can we just also ask like what our, what the level of access or insight is into that account? Because obviously Chris has, you know, full view of mm -hmm. our accounts and their balances. Does this change that in any way if now mm -hmm. we're sharing it that mm -hmm. I just I'd just like to know. This versus I, I just, all of our Yeah, what yeah. we have currently which yeah, is um, absolutely you know very transparent to something that's shared with the town. I well, I mean it's all part of the town, but uh, is there a difference? Um, yeah, I mean, I do have access now to the town's general letter so we can see any account either we have or the town has. But I suppose it depends on where it's placed and if yeah. you have limited access to it. Okay. Okay. I'll get more information. And it wouldn't be on the, well, I don't know, that has to be on the warrant. That's the other thing. It says a warrant article, so it, I, it would not, the way I read the law, it doesn't get voted until it's just the vote of the two bodies if that's the direction that the school committee decided to go in the right. So that. then we wouldn't need the February 9th deadline. Okay. Budget timeline. Yeah, I can. Uh, I think we can also just move into a general where we are right now with the budget and yeah. um, kind of what we're looking at in general in terms of if nothing changes, where we're at with anticipated what it would cost to fund all the requests. You know, in December we asked the, the teachers to tell us what they need to do their work well. They've submitted all of their requests. Um, and so tonight, then Chris will kind of say, this is, if we funded all of those exactly as requested, this is where we would end up. And um, if there's any additional direction, in February you can expect to get a draft of line items, and it's still a draft until your your final vote is in April. So. Right. So yeah. yeah, as it stands right now, it's a 2.44 percent increase over last year's budget. Mm -hmm. um, that has taken into account any um, personnel moves, retirements, step increases, that kind of thing. Um, 
and it also in includes all of the requests made by the staff members that had you know input on the budget. So I mean, you know, we've certainly had it worse, without a doubt. Um, you know, that's not really too bad. Uh, a lot of it again will depend on grant funding. How much are, are we going to get? Some of the grants we have seen to be very stable. We get the same amount year after year. Um, you know, some of them have gone up slightly, but there were some that have decreased as well, such as um, the preschool grant, which is, it, I guess it's dropping by about a third every year. So it, um, <clears throat> what we're expecting is about 30,000 next year. Two years ago it was 60, so you know, it's, it's just dropping every year. Um, that's all, quite honestly, unknown at this point in time. That's a state grant? The, the preschool mm -hmm. ones, yes. So the 2.44 increase, um, is that, and you said that includes the request, so is the nature of the request, like you had said, you know, what what do you need to, to do your work, would you characterize that as level service, that we're providing the same service, yet these are the tools that are needed to continue to provide that same level of service? It, or are we it's it's kind of a level service plus, I guess. Mm -hmm. it, it's not you know, a super enhanced or anything like that, yeah. but it's, 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 it's what we had last year, or this year, I guess, plus, geez, it'd be great if we could have this and that, you know, so those items have been added in. Mm -hmm. So, and that would mean slight increases, so not a wholesale adoption of, um, like, adding a new program, adding teaching foreign language at the elementary school, not adding additional staff. Some of the increases, which this always happens, um, some of the increases that you see in terms of personnel is that when you build and approve the budget year we're in, so you approved that budget in April of 2017, mm -hmm. and even between April of 2017 and now, I can tell you without a doubt, we've increased staffing and in educational support professionals. We've had students enter the district to have needed one-to-one uh, -one aids. So there is, there's, right. so, level service and there are some additions but there's no wholesale like we added a new program we added another section or a teacher okay. um, staff increases in staff would be educational support professionals that's it that takes into consideration all settled contracts mm -hmm. um and um yeah but we have not um done any sort of real like and if we were if we had to shave things off what would they be would it take into account any of the <coughs> requested types of additions we heard tonight from Julie uh, regarding CPAC? So two things around that. One, with um, professional development, um, I think that I think that there are some low to no cost ways to address that. I think it has not forever, but I think one of the one of the ways even Julie was talking about some of the low and no cost options. But I think sometimes it's really more about thinking about time differently when we build the elementary schedule. We have to first make sure that there aren't any. We aren't creating our own impediments, and then trying to solve them with money. And there's ways to solve them by organizing our schedule better. Yeah. Um, and then I think the concern about because um, I will full disclosure say I speak to the chairs of CPAC. It's, it's what, what I didn't hear was, you must devote this much money to X, but rather um, be open to, if you're supporting a, a new director of special education, if we're going to attempt, because that role is solely special education. So remember, we had, when Pat had the job full time, she was also wearing a million hats. Mm -hmm. Some of those things I've taken on, Title I, Title III, Title IIA, I do that now. So the goal is that with that's singular focus on special education, that this is still a manageable job that can be done well. I agree with, with CPAC, I do not want to go back to having different liaisons, sharing yeah. team meetings. Not good for teachers, just not good for cohesion. But I think they're saying, okay, we're gonna try this, but if additional support is needed, please take that into consideration. Make sure there's something in your school choice reserve account in case there's something that you don't know. We don't know yet what the next special ed education director might recommend or say mm -hmm. that they need. So I think that consideration comes in when applying school choice monies to the operating budget. That we do 
what the policy has already always dictated that, that you maintain the freedom to serve. <coughs> Any other questions about the projection on the budget? So what are the next steps on that again? There's multiple steps, right? So we have to yeah, we're getting some feedback from the town. There's some concern, uh, as I said, David called today. His concern is about the governor's um, cherry sheet. I don't have that in your packet. It is available publicly. When you go to municipal, um, it's referred to as um, local aid assessments. Mm -hmm. so I'm sorry, you can find it right online, and you can look up Hadley and local aid assessments. Mass.gov is also commonly referred to as the cherry sheet. When you put in your community, there's two parts to it. There's your projected receipts, and there's your projected uh, expenses. What the governor is projecting right now, um, and, and Chris can help make sense of it, because I was losing my ever-lover mind moments ago. The projections indicate that the school choice sending tuitions, which are paid on the town side, and the charter school sending tuitions will increase. Between the two of them, increase uh, by about 100 and is $140,000, roughly, maybe, um, around $140,000. Um, and I couldn't make sense of where the governor's budget was drawing the numbers from to get there. Because if I look at our school choice sending numbers from June of 17 and what we turned into the state in December that I can look in the security portal, there's no change. If I look at charter school, quarter four to 2017, which is exactly, you pay charter school tuitions in actual real time, but they give you these projections based on quarterly enrollments. When I look at June of 17, and when I look at quarter two right now, it's an increase of four students. Four students is not $84,000. Our charter school tuitions are not 21 apiece. Now, Chris, I emailed him and said, what's going on? And he emailed back and said, so now everybody knows our secrets. Don't worry, I can explain it. So, so what is that? <laughs> Uh, well, basically, let me, I have to find, oh, it was in, in an email. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they used the 2018 cherry sheet estimate, which was really the 2017 numbers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so they're showing an increase in, in school choice, we'll just say, of about $55,000. Mm -hmm. um, will be receiving or will be expending? Expending. expending. These are on the expense side. Right. Um, I mean, the bottom line is we're actually experiencing that right now because mm -hmm. when you compare actual 2018 to 19, it's actually dropping by about $1,000. But they, they're using, they're, using they're basically comparing 17 to a projected 19. And from 17 to 18, there was a jump up. Um, I just quickly pulled the reports and ran it. But yeah, we, um, sending number of students sending out went from we'll say 47 to 55 mm -hmm. um, from 17 to 18 so you know there definitely was movement but the report is is a little misleading in that it's they call it the FY 18 estimate it's really the FY 17 actual number that they were using um, that number in FY 18 ramped up quickly so um, it's actually it's very similar to what we're seeing right now um, in FY18, and you know, of course, there was no crystal ball as to what actually will happen in FY19 as far as that goes. But um, it's it's not quite the drastic spread that, that it appears to be because we've already seen that drastic spread. It's already here. It's it's not something that you know is necessarily in the future. So it's it's not good news either way because it's still an increase in money going out without a doubt. And to your question, Paul, the next steps, I brought that up because I see the next steps as this. We've asked staff, we bring to you in February more of a line item, like here's where the greatest spikes are and why. Um, and I'm also in communication, we're in communication with David to get the sense of are there parameters that the town, um, are there recommendations or parameters that the town is looking to set? And legally, what the town, legally, the school committee and solely the school committee has authority over the school committee budget. You are charged with, and legislatively, um, yes, we're always charged with being responsible. The superintendent, the law is clear. My job is to recommend to you a budget that's in the best interest of students. 
the job of the school committee is to advocate for a budget that's reasonable, that's in the best interest of schools and students. The town has the authority on town meeting floor to present a budget. They are only legally obligated to give required school spending. They've never done that here. They never would. But that's their legal authority. They could say, no, actually, this is what we're putting in the budget. Last year, if you remember, I think it was just a, it was just a minor difference from what we had asked. And there was a reduction that the town put in the warrant that's absolutely within their authority. Um, and so now I'm trying to get some feedback on what are, what are the parameters from town. And um, what we will bring to you is any parameters that we get from them. Also, you know, here's what it looks like line by line based on the requests, and here, you know, here, if we get parameters or recommendations from the town, this would be the this this would be the implications or effects of that. I'll bring that to you in February. But technically, the next steps are you ultimately decide to adopt and vote for the budget that you want to advocate for, and the town side has the authority to go as low as. So within their legal rights to put whatever they want in the warrant as long as it is, it is at least required school um, spending. Which How many students do we have graduating that are either um, in choice schools right now in um, Smith Volk, out of district that we are paying? Oh, so I don't know exactly. I don't have a, uh, for example, a Smith Volk list. I can bring to you next time when we're bringing that line for line and show you what will happen in terms of school choice sending, mm -hmm. so what grades they're in. Mm -hmm. I will also show you school choice receiving what grades they're in. One of the things that's, that hit us hard in school choice is mm -hmm. we had a graduating class of 31 choice kids, mm -hmm. um, so that was a big hit the next year mm -hmm. right, in terms of school choice receiving. Um, so I'll, when we bring that, I'll bring you the breakdown of what's happening <coughs> at the grade levels um, in receiving and sending as a choice projections for too. charter. Um, so you can take it based on, your projection is just based on your actual right now. The assumption right. that you're making is they're going to stay where they're at. Sure. Um, that isn't always the case. Absolutely. Okay. And the charter schools too. Mm -hmm. That'll be included. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We can do a great breakdown on charter schools for you too. That'd be great. Okay, so that's and you don't have anything from Tribor. Part of it is to say, is there anything that you, at this point, the school committee would say to us, when you build that, here's your cap, here's your, or you don't have any specific direction that you want to give us. You're not expected to right now, but. 2% has always been, you know, at least for me, the measure that I've mm -hmm. heard. So I'm actually encouraged by mm -hmm. hearing that after polling mm -hmm. the group mm -hmm. that, and being able to say, We've settled all the contracts that we settled. We've infused those mm -hmm. um, required increases mm -hmm. in here and contract uh, agreements, and that we've um, not added positions, mm -hmm. which we've agreed. You know, we're not adding mm -hmm. services. So I feel like this is pretty true to the direction we've been given consistently. Of you know, trying to adhere to level service and roughly two percent. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Okay, calendar. Yep, yeah, this is take. Yep. Yeah. Sure. So this is take a vote. The only thing that's not in it is that the actual days of parent conferences, um, and the actual days of open house are uh, to be determined. But I know parents are eager. If they start doing their planning, what they really want to know is when the vacations are and uh, when does school start and end. Um, this looks very much like last year's calendar. I did sit down with the president of the AGA. Although this, the calendar of school committee's authority, but I always get his input, and we sit and look at it, and he gave some suggestions, and then here's where we landed. Um, one thing that I will point out to you is that we have, typically when we've done a spring, um, when we have our spring curriculum days, so that last day of school where teachers are here after students, we actually put that back this idea about having relevant professional development, put it back in the spring during the school year. We originally had it on the same day as town election day, and um, the, the, the suggestion was <coughs> it's kind of disruptive, it's in the middle of the week. It's much more helpful when those days, about a weekend, that we don't come back, go to school for two days, go home, go to school for two days, just not helpful. Um, and we did talk to the town and they were fine. It's six and one half dozen of another in terms of 
we've had school open during elections in November, and so we just work with them. So it's April 5th mm -hmm. instead of the 9th. Correct. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that makes sense too, given the election day would be, um, you know, a Tuesday, and then you have the whole next week off. Right. 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 Yeah. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Any questions about the calendar? Is there a motion for approval? Motion to approve the 2018 to 2019 calendar. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So I'm sorry. Town election day is it closed? It is closed. No, 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 we're, we're open. open. We're over open. But we make it work. We've done it uh, before. Yeah, we make it work. So we just, they do the elections in the gym. and Yeah. Mm -hmm. We tell the students to run the companies for their exercise. Okay, let's see. Go back to the page here. What do we got? What is next? Personal right. Principal search. Yeah, not a lot in the personal report. report. Um, and you can see we have a couple of vacancies still, spring coaching and two essentially ESP and BA tech positions. Um, and then the principal search, uh, we, they will be doing their uh, interviews of semifinalists next week. Great. And then they will forward uh, some names to me for and I have no idea who the semifinals are. That's entirely the committee's charge with that. How so many are there? I believe they're doing eight interviews. Wow. That's great. Uh, they're doing eight interviews. I believe maybe seven. I think it's eight. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, I did. Okay. Okay. Hearing about that, okay. Uh, Chris, you're back on the Chris show. Okay. Um, so we first have the expense report. I brought my wrong glasses today, so I keep <laughs> taking them off and putting them on. Um, these, uh, let's see, I mean, again. What do you use your wrong glasses for? Uh, these are, <laughs> <laughs> are reading glasses, oh, okay. which I just, I had apparently next to my progressive lenses. Oh. And so I grabbed these, threw them in my glasses case, and I'm like, why can't I see? Because uh. if I put them on, I can't see you guys at all. Oh, and, okay. and But I can see this, so. <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't figure it out, and then I looked, and I'm like, these are not my glasses, and, you know, sometimes you're just not 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently that was one of those times. Um, so, uh, you know, again, nothing nothing bad to report. Um, you know, some, some lines are over. Um, some lines are over almost by design, and uh, I can discuss those. A little further on here uh, again the tuition to non-public schools is um, you know still way over budget again that's one of those items where I moved some money to the grant I will move more money to the grant because we have a large amount of that um, designated for the 240 sped grant mm -hmm. that you know you don't want to just move say a hundred and thirty thousand dollars into it in one month so I moved I think it was 25,000. I have another 35 set to go. Um, basically, I can do that on Monday. Um, and I will just keep moving money to that. Um, and it, what we did was just to, to kind of simplify setting up the purchase orders for those. Um, it got very confusing last year as you know there was a lot of movement in that. And there were purchase orders that were split among, you know, part of it went to circuit breaker, part of it went to the local budget. And it got very difficult to determine hmm, how much do we have, you know, still remaining in these things. So I told Pat, just put them all to the local budget, and what we will do is we'll move the expenses later on. Um, and that that just makes it again easier for us to see where we stand than having these split up over a number of items. And it it got really uh, difficult to track, I guess, if all of a sudden a student was no longer utilizing that same service or something and it's okay now we have an open purchase order in two different accounts and you know it just it really became a, a, a difficult thing so um, when I say that you know it's by design obviously being above the budget amount is not by design but the fact that all the expenses went to here is so um, you know a, as you know me by now I tell you if um, you know if I was concerned I'm not so um, not really in the least actually we're, we're doing very well so um, 
you know, some of the other items that you see, again, transportation, um, you know, sped transportation, um, that is, as you can see, again, over budget. And again, we have a, a good amount of that that's supposed to go to the 240 grant. I also have to take a look at the encumbrance in that item. You can see we have 78,000 encumbered. Considering that the school year is almost half over, or mm -hmm. must be getting pretty close to that anyway, and we've spent 42,000 so far, I can't really see us spending another 78 um, till the remainder of the year. So I think that that's over encumbered. That will bring down the, you know, the shortfall in the budget amount as well. So, you know, there's a little bit of, of investigation that needs to come into this still, but um, again, really, um, you know, we're looking okay. I just had a question on um, the maintenance, like other for buildings. Sure. And, uh, just wondering what kinds of things go into that and whether, I mean, it's obviously not heating, plumbing, electrical, or custodial equipment. Mm -hmm. What's on the last page? Yeah, the sorry, the last page, page nine. Okay. $43,000 budget, $43,500. Uh, yeah, I was curious what goes into that given it's a larger budget than some of the other line items in there. That's uh, almost like a catch-all of yeah. every other maintenance thing that's not heating, plumbing, or electrical, yeah. uh, which ends up being actually quite a bit yeah. of, of items, you know, uh, a door that needs fixing or, you know, I mean, anything like that. I mean, you wouldn't believe the things that that break down in a school oh, building. Yeah. No, and cool. so that, I mean, I know it sounds almost funny to say it's the catch-all, but anything that's not one of those items gets put to that okay. account. And that's why it's so much larger, because there are so many more expenses um, that we have in that area that, you know, that's why it's so yeah. big. Um, one of the items that, in particular, Jeff Mission I meet every week, actually every day I'm here, uh, we meet. and. Uh, he was pretty excited that the heating uh, repairs this year were much less than we've seen in prior years. The heating system, yeah. especially at Hopkins, it's old, and mm -hmm. you know there can certainly be some issues. But we've really been chipping away at those year after year, and as you can see, not really. You know, we we still have twelve, almost thirteen thousand dollars remaining. So right. you know, knock on the plastic table here. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that continues. Okay. And again, you know, as as always, at the end of the year, if we end up having say ten thousand dollars, you know, extra in the heating maintenance line, that goes to cover the accounts that might be showing the shortfall as right. well. Mm -hmm. So, all right, grants. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so grant report uh, again with the Title One. That's that's fully spent. You can see the uh, the two forty special ed grant. We're seeing a little bit more that's used, still a good amount remaining uh, to be spent in that line. And the circuit breaker is, is really the big one that we just really haven't put a lot of expenses to at this point in time. So yeah. you know, that's where I, a good portion of that sped tuition overage is going to go. Um, you know, the early childhood 262 grant, that pays for part of one of the Paris salaries. What I typically do is, you know, really just choose a point in time and transfer the full amount to that grant. Um, you know, it, it, it's $3,400, so it's, it's not something that we're going to allocate, you know, $80 a paycheck every week, go, you know, over X amount of payrolls. We'll just move the entire amount in all at once. So, I mean, I can do that at any time now. Um, the, the, you know, the rest of them, again, you can see that inclusive preschool, the 391 at the very bottom. That's the grant I was telling you. It was 61,000 last year. It's down to about 45, we'll call it this year. So next year we're expecting the same decrease down to 30. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, again, that will all be utilized by the end of the year as well. Okay. What have you used that one for again, too? That pays for, when it was larger, it used to pay for the uh, preschool, the, the kind of the preschool director. Yeah. Uh, paid for mm -hmm. her salary. Um, and a couple of aides salaries now it pays for her salary a portion of it only um, and the rest of it comes out of the preschool revolving account okay all right revolving accounts okay so lunch. this lunch account <laughs> hey you're here you're I know. <laughs> Weird lunch trust me you, you, you as it feels yeah, yeah. yeah i know <laughs> 
especially since I shot my mouth off or my typewriter off, whatever you want to call it. Um, so again, it, we're almost in the same situation as we were last month with the exception of we finally received that September payment that was held up, um, but none of the revenues in December that were paid, say by cash or on the website, uh, have been posted yet, and none of the uh, state reimbursements were, were posted yet either. So we're looking at roughly, I mean, it's December, so there was a week off with no school, so you know, that's less lunches, but I, I'm estimating about $10,000 that has not been posted. So okay. that will actually, you know, again, I, I'm really hoping in January just to, just to make the report look a little better, quite honestly. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that we know it's there, you know, it's just the, the town posts those items and, you know, there's a number of steps they have to do, obviously, before they, they post all the revenues. And sometimes this report just gets run before they've had a chance to post them. I could go in and kind of manually do that, but I hate to report on a balance that's not really in the system yet, even though we know it's there. So I prefer to just kind of post what's actually showing up in the general ledger and then just letting you know that there's really more than the meets the eye to these. Um, so the school choice is looking healthy. That goes up when we get payments from from other schools. So you see how it goes up roughly, like take your your June 30, yeah, it's about 47, 46. So say you take your, your June 30 money, it means that they, right. they true up, they look who was actually there and they settle all your accounts and then you do get paid in real time the students that you have. So to Chris's point about the cherry sheet is looking at estimates. These payments are receipts and our payments happen in real time. But Chris will be asking the school committee, this is to help the, the general public understand, especially around public uh, around budget time, it's easier for people to say there's a million dollars in that school choice, the school department doesn't need any money. But remember in your operating budget, you've already said you're going to spend over half a million dollars of school choice money, I believe, in the operating budget. Chris is going to ask you to appropriate some this evening decrease that by $350,000. Mm -hmm. um, you can estimate your payments coming in for the end of the year. Yeah, the nice thing about school choice this year, last year, um, you know, we were zipping along at, say, I don't know, I think it was about $54,000 a year. And then when they, a month. When, I mean a yeah. month, yes, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And then when they trued up the numbers in December, that's when they make their adjustment. And it dropped down to $23,000. And I'm like, ouch, you know, what happened here? And for the rest of the year, mm -hmm. we were getting $23,000 a month as opposed to the 50-something you know, thousand. Mm -hmm. This year, we were getting $46,000 a month. It dropped down to 45 and change. So mm -hmm. a much less drastic decrease than, than what we saw the year before. Because uh, so that had to do a lot really with that graduating class. They take that projection and they, they don't see that graduating class. They just take your numbers and carry them forward. Right. They don't know what grade students are. Can I present that? Can I tell you exactly how it needs to be worded? Yes. Yes, you can. Because it, what we need to do is to transfer three hundred and fifty dollars of expenses from the local budget to school choice. Three hundred fifty thousand. Did I say three hundred fifty dollars? That yeah. won't help much. <laughs> <laughs> of ex I'm sorry. So say it again. We need to transfer three hundred fifty thousand dollars of expenses from our local budget to school choice. We can't move school choice money into the local budget because that would be increasing the budget, so we need to move expenses from the budget to the school choice account. You know you tell me that every year. How's it working? I don't remember. No. <laughs> Is there a motion to uh, do a person? <laughs> make a motion to $350,000 worth of expenses from the local budget to the school choice. Yes. For a second? Second. All in favor? Do you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. It just, is, it just looked like it was backwards, so I had to read again when uh, I Because <laughs> then, yeah. That makes sense, in yeah. The, in yeah. the action item, it is backwards. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Approved. Okay, um, capital plan, girls' locker room update. So remember you had asked for if we could yeah. shrink the plans or let you know what was happening. Chris can talk about Chris had Jeff and Eric go through and 
and this is their feedback because you wanted their feedback. The committee wanted their feedback in the locker room. Yeah, we're, we're going to try to shrink the plans down. I mean, obviously, it's a blueprint this big, you know, so we don't have a copier, first of all, big enough to take that. And I just, I don't even know if, you know, if you take something this big and you make it this big, is it even going to be something that you can read? Um, but we're going to give it a shot anyway and, you know, see if we can. But what I did was I, I just kind of made some notes of what the changes were. Um, I mean, it, it's kind of hard to visualize, but... You know, nevertheless, I mean, you know, like just just increasing the number of sinks and toilets, obviously, that that's a big help. Um, they're moving the the lockers. They're taking out the old ones, and they're going to store equipment there. Um, they're also taking out the showers, and that's where the new lockers are going to go. Again, you know, if we had the actual picture or something, it, it would make a lot more sense. But um, and and so now those showers are going to be moved to the back of the locker room. We'll have four showers and one handicapped access shower and there will be like a privacy changing area for each shower instead of just a you know kind of an open area um, what happens with this is that just by you know the, the moving of the showers and the lockers it creates a better line of sight so you can see across the entire locker room that's you know certainly something that's nice to see um, you know all of the lighting and ventilation will both be obviously um, you know, removed and replaced with newer lighting. So the lighting will all be, uh, you know, better lighting than what we have in there now. The ventilation, that will be a big help because, you know, again, the, the system is very old. <coughs> um, the heating units, of course, you know, anytime you have metal heating, heating units in a locker room that, I, I don't really know how often the showers are used quite honestly now, but I mean, there was a time when they were used quite often and that, what did that do? It created steam and so the, the heating units are now obviously uh, you know, rusted, mm -hmm. and uh, and the windows would be changed out as well. So you know, a lot of the windows in the building, some were changed um, about ten years ago. A lot of them were not. These are some that would be changed to newer windows. You know, it, it's nice when you do these things and you actually get some kind of a cost savings in the end. Um, and so this will help a little bit. I mean, it, it, it's not going to reduce our oil usage in half or anything, but you know. Again, it's just one of those side benefits of, of the job. So it's just kind of a summary. Um, I don't know if I mentioned it to you last month or not, but Jeff did take the plans to the building inspector, and they, they still all did comply with the um, codes. Great. So that's a good thing. You know, we don't have to go and have the plans yeah. redone. It's just a question of, you know, at this point in time, you know, any kind of cost estimates that were received in, I believe this is 2009, mm -hmm. Yeah. that's obviously out the door at this point in time and it's it's tough to get new cost estimates for this because obviously anybody that's going to give you an estimate if you know if you if you asked say a contractor to do or something it's not easy to get someone willing to do it because it would it would take them a couple of days of their time probably to do this for a job that you know, might not even get done or you know or that's going to go out to bid it's not like they would be guaranteed of getting it or anything so you know, as we move closer and, and, you know, we're looking to actually get this done, we may have to reach out to, you know, an architect or something. You know, similar to how the fields were priced out, you know, and was it wasn't actually, for the yeah, yeah. And, and just ask them to give us a best guess, you know, yeah. obviously a, an educated guess. Right. But, and uh, we can pay them for their time. I mean, we obviously, yeah, we have yeah. to do that, yeah. But that seems like a less mm -hmm. expensive... Um, process given we already have plans that right. seem to work right they don't have to that's a big deal because too. i don't know what those cost but I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm sure it was cheap yeah so. mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. great thanks well thank you for it yeah. so you're gonna have costs for we were there conditioners <laughs> oh i guess my timing was good with that because i reached out to them a couple of weeks ago and he was going on vacation so i reached out again yesterday he called me back today and we are looking to actually go out we're, we're going to place the ads next week okay uh, so and I, I did explain to him, we'll have the same kind of bid. I said we need, we need them to bid on four items. Number one would be the, um, the total job. Um, number two would be wing one, three would be wing two, and four would be wing three. And that way, again, if we can only get two of the wings done, you know, it, it's better than zero at that point in time. So talk to me about timing. When would they actually be able to do work? Well, and that's, that's another one of those items. If they could do it over a vacation, 
that would be ideal because again, what that would do is it would certainly help to lower the cost. Right. Um, Maybe the other April. option is over summer vacation, in which case. Um, oh, we've got April coming up. Right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, February obviously would be too soon. Too soon. But uh, and you know, Jeff was just kind of asking around, and apparently, from what he heard, the timing is good because a lot of the MGM project is being wrapped up, mm -hmm. and so people are actually. You know, they don't have a year's worth of work ahead of them anymore. Now they're starting to think about what they're going to do later on. So um, we'll actually hopefully get more bids than the one bid we received last time. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Uh, water testing. I, so I informed and sent the community information, and Paul had suggested that we take a look at installing water fountains that have the option of filling filtered water bottles. Mm -hmm. The units themselves are not necessarily cost prohibitive. We have to look at maintenance and installation costs. You actually may have gotten some numbers on that. I did. So I not only that, do they bottle uh, fillers, but they have filters. Mm -hmm. So the maintenance is uh, a lot of the filters. I talked to the company LK, who makes mm -hmm. a common brand you see in the airports. Mm -hmm. They're about $1,000 a piece. Eight, $900, you could probably get a discount for a mm -hmm. school. They have uh, local uh, resellers, so you, you work with that contract and some of them give you discounts for schools. I don't know how many we'd want to purchase. We might get group discounts if we bought more at a time. Mm -hmm. She estimated about $250 per fountain a year for a filter. So not only, I mean, I know the lead testing is coming out clean, but just to have um, filtered water would be good for our kids. And I know, um, just talking to informal survey of other students and teachers, I think they said they'd be used, it'd reduce the bottle waste, um, the plastic waste, and we get our kids to drink water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, just so I understand, these are these are um, self-standing <coughs> ones, or these are filters that go into the existing fountains? No, we didn't get new fountains. So it would be with new fountains you could mm -hmm. put the filters in? Mm -hmm. Have you seen those where you put the bottle in? So it's a water fountain, yeah, traditional yeah. fountain where you push, push and yeah. it squirts. Yeah. But you can also, it has got a receptacle where you stick your own bottle in, okay. and it fills it. So um, so we just need to look at installation costs. I can't remember if you told me you had a sense of installation costs. Maybe that's not fair. I don't, yeah. That's, that was the unknown, yeah, is what's know. the installation cost. So we can talk to with Jeff and figure out what, what it might be for installation cost for. Um, so if you'd figure, you could figure, say you got a discount, $800 a piece, $250 maintenance a year per, I don't know what the installation mm -hmm. cost is. Yeah, that's the big unknown. Yeah. We'll definitely look at that. Thankfully, our water is clean, but that still doesn't take that option off the table at all. That's a great option. Um, and, um, okay. Good. I always love those questions. I am so. All right. Uh, school committee reports. So negotiations, Tara. Um, so we've had several meetings. And we are going to go into the executive session today to talk just a little bit more before we go back again next week and hopefully wrap up and come to an agreement. Mm -hmm. And there's one thing that we need to agree upon, which is what I'm going to write to as an executive session. It was unit D. Unit D. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Great. We'll be done. Okay. Hopefully next week. And then you also did uh, finance track board. Mm -hmm. Yep, and so one of the things was the um, ACHCG that was kind of brought up and prompt to at the end, um, and then really the one and only question that was asked was budget. Um, and it was asked if we could have our budget presented to them um, within the next two weeks from the tri board meeting. Um, I did explain to them our timeline on what the budget would be, so I don't, I, you know, I explained it and I'm not sure that's something we would be able to get done any. Um, and then they really did, as Annie had already said, they were really looking at projections and looking at departments, looking at um, where they needed to save and where we can cut costs. Yeah. Um, they do have it all online. So okay. cutting costs because the um, town budget projection is a decrease from last year? Um, well, because of the funding that the town needs to provide based on things that were approved at town meeting. So the biggest fund that they're looking at right now is the additional fire personnel funding that is their biggest cost. Because in terms of receipts, I mean, I can certainly talk about the school side. So the estimates that we just pointed out are that um, Chapter 70, even with the governor's recommended, if the 2% increase goes through, it doesn't help you 
tremendously if you're losing enrollment, because Chapter 70 is tied to your per capita count. I shouldn't say if you're losing enrollment, it's you're losing population. Chapter 70 is from population. Um, and so if you're losing school age population, it's great if it goes up by a couple percentages, but it doesn't, it's not when people say, oh, the Chapter 70 is going way up. It's not in declining population chapter, areas. Chapter That's the, the aid that comes from the state for the education of, or it's tied to the population of school age children in your, in your district. It's local aid, that's what they call it. And so that, um, they're, so they're talking about a 2% increase, but again, when you talk about declining population, that's not, you know, you're lucky if you hold even on that. And then on our receipts and expenses side, our school choice receipts after our dip, the kids coming in, so after we take out graduating classes, it has gone down. It's still higher than it was a few years ago. You know, it's at a lower place, so, um, but it has gone down. Um, we're hopeful. Like I told you, I asked you to approve school choice last month because we have at least <coughs> 10 inquiry, inquiries at Hopkins right now. Um, but our charter choice uh, expenses are estimated to go up. What I'm curious about is, I understand that there's some expenses that the town needs to cover. Did they talk at all about, you know, the, the economy is doing great, and like you said, Paul, and somehow public services are still star starving. Did they talk about receipts on the town side? That, um, did they bring up, I'm just curious that they brought up like meals tax, hotel, or how are receipts doing on the town side, or did they get to that? They did not get to that from my understanding. The focus on was really going over, and I can actually even make copies mm -hmm. of this for you guys and just give it to you mm -hmm. or CNN and send it to you so you have it since you weren't there. It was really looking at calculating the total budget, and they've broken it down into different service areas is what they're calling it. Mm -hmm. So the town, um, the budgets for the town, which includes the general government, and this took up the majority of the time mm -hmm. tri board. It didn't stay for some of the um, Public safety, school, um, human services and then their debt services and then benefits and what they did was they looked at the town's budget the fixed budget budget things they can't um, change and then things that they put the school kind of in its own little column with our budget so then what they looked at was their fixed budget adjusted and then they looked at where they were looking to make cuts and then sample amounts of Mm -hmm. what it would mean for each department that needed the cut, how much they would need to be cut by and percentage-wise. Right. So um, it was not brought up at school at all for cutting a budget. It was um, general government budget cuts was the thing. Mm -hmm. So DPW was one that was, as an example, brought up. And they don't have amounts that they're asking. They have projections of what they're expecting for cuts, but they don't, mm -hmm. I think at this point they're asking before mandating a percentage cut or saying you need to cut back by x number of wherever figure out how you're going to save this money they really want um collaboration was their big thing looking at departments and how departments and services can collaborate um in order to reduce reduce costs without really right cutting mm -hmm. jobs or whatnot. and that was really the most of the conversation we've talked a lot about that like sharing services mm -hmm. or um, mm -hmm sharing positions or things like that that can help to co not co collapse is a harsh word but collaborate and mm -hmm. you know, combine right well. in order to avoid as much cutting costs as they could yeah mm -hmm. did they say anything about um, usually they bring up OPEB funding and that that's that may be in the um, that might be in the select board portion they didn't uh, the category one of the categories you mentioned about um, it's like retirement services. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So other post-employment benefits, right. and that is specifically the healthcare costs associated with when somebody retires, who's mm -hmm. given ten years to the system, they're vested at that point, mm -hmm. and the window between retirement age and med help me which one it is, care eligibility, right? Senior citizen. Yeah. Okay. That care yeah. eligibility. That window um, is. Those are the post-employment. It is not pension money. That's self-funded through a different fund. It is the health care benefit window. That's all it is. So one of the expenses that we're carrying is the allocating of funds in for OPEB, like mm -hmm. earmarking of funds for mm -hmm. OPEB, and that's, mm -hmm. that's been discussed in the past as one of the, um, you know, we're doing due diligence by as a town by investing in that now, and mm -hmm. um, 
and we're supposed to, but it's also something that's like not directly being drawn upon now. It's we're saving for the future. That's so, as I understand. And I I'm not the expert on this. There's been a correct. difference of opinions too yeah. in the past between the slope and yeah. what that's gonna yeah. be and whether or not we should be investing now or or using yeah. the allocations. And, and that's yep. correct, and people will argue that that investment, so when you set up a trust in this town, I believe it has a trust. Once it's in there, you cannot take it out of the trust until you dissolve the trust. I do believe they have a trust. Perhaps they don't have a trust, and they just have an earmarked fund, which is different. But given the benefits that they're getting from it, my money's on the fact that it's a trust. If you have a trust set up, you earn much higher rates on the money that you put aside. Um, but again, you don't get to take it out until the trust is dissolved by vote. Um, that is not a real-time expense right now. It's a projected expense that's right. developed by actuaries. Right. Some people argue, great to aggressively fund that or uh, do your due diligence because it does great things for your rating, your credit rating. Other people argue, and um, it, the actuaries, those could change. At any point in time, a town can change um, its health care benefits, right? Mm -hmm. The products that it offers, the percentage that it offers, mm -hmm. and who's in that pool that you're paying for is subject to change. Yeah. So that's what the debate rages. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, fields. We already touched on mm -hmm. that. Anything else? No. Okay. And collaborative the mayor's not here. Mm -hmm. Any anything that you're No, with? just what I told you about the share. Yeah. All right. So go. Okay. So now action items. Um, we need a, a motion to approve the AP warrants submitted in January twenty eighth. A motion to approve the AP warrants submitted in January of 2018. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 And approval of the um, December 18th, 2017 minutes. Any questions on those? I just have one question. Yeah. I was reading through a um, meeting with public safety. Obviously, it wasn't this month. Do we have an idea of when we might be meeting? About um, some of their recommendations. Yes. About some of the recommendations yeah. for the capital plan. I will ask them to come in February. We changed the date of our meeting. And, mm -hmm. yeah. I figured as much. I just wanted to. Yeah. yeah that's a good idea, too, just in case there's mm -hmm. any um, yeah. things that impact our plan. Okay. Um, so is there a motion to approve the minutes? We move to approve the minutes of the December 18th meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, is there a motion to approve the warrants uh, submitted in January 2018? Motion to approve the warrants in January 2018. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All abstain? No. Okay, uh, we already approved the transfer. We approved the calendar. Oh, we've got some tax books lying around. We do. Surplus property. Do you have a list? I do. Oh, boy. I, I don't really think you want me to go through the list. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, <laughs> not that it's always just fun to see what's on the list. Well, we have, um, I, I don't really even know what the details are. It's okay. Of the years. Yes. <laughs> but, um, yeah, they're, they're outdated textbooks, and the elementary school would love to be able to remove them from the cart that's in the cafeteria, just to read the books. Um, and so they provided me with this list of books, and I just need to ask you, there's, looks like there's about four classes worth of books, you know, different, different grades. Um, social studies, I see some math, um, science, and then we have teacher manuals and all of that, you know, kind of thing that goes with it. Um, so they, basically they're looking, they looked into what they could possibly do to actually try to get some revenue out of these, um, but it does not seem to be something that's likely, I think probably based on the age of the books. Uh, they reached out to the publishers and the publishers said, yeah, you can box them up and ship them back to us and if we find anyone willing to buy them, that buy them we'll give you 50 cents a book. And of course, you know, the time spent in boxing them up and shipping them, <laughs> it's a lose situation. So. Um, well, what we did the last time was we ended up you know, recycling them, putting them in the recycling, and uh, we'll do that again. All right, so I make a motion to agree with the book. Uh, what call it? Declare them surplus property. Surplus, surplusing. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Okay. Um, so before we go into executive session, our next regular meeting date, it should be so the 26th, which is the Monday after the break mm -hmm. week. Is that okay with everybody so far? You said February 26th? Yeah. All right, we'll plan on that uh, unless we hear otherwise and unclear whether we'll need exec session yet for that. So we probably will. God willing, we get our contract settled, and so that will start okay. at 30 and we'll start to exactly. figure it out. Okay, sounds good. All right, um, great then. All right, do we have a uh, motion to um, enter exec session as worded in the agenda? Somebody want to say that? Mm -hmm. Sure. I motion to move into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining. I've determined an open meeting will have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and to not reconvene the position. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So you have to roll call. Uh, roll call. Keith? Aye. Tara? Aye. Paul? Aye. Tyler? Yes. Aye. Okay. All right. We will. Enter executive session.